So it's like three or two, let me start. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming. So it's gonna be a small group, uh, but the idea is that I want to keep it interactive because it's a very interesting set of tools and how do we learn more about this thing. Uh, one thing that uh, I'm not so sure if we are we doing any recording, are we gonna post it after or not? So yes, I'm just, I just started recording and we will post it once uh, so, early at, by the end of the day. So you have to be aware that we'll post it and it will be open so on the recording. But the idea is that we have in the chat, you have a document, you go at the bottom, you can post any question and then you can answer those things uh, later. You don't need to do it in the talk. Uh, but because we are in a small group, I think it will be good if we can have a little more interactivity. So if you have a question, raise your hand and then either the speaker tells me or the speaker does directly, I can unmute the person and can answer the question. Um, so any questions on logistics? No? Okay, good. So the first speaker is Heinz uh, Reiner. He's from EPFL. Um, I'm very interested in the tools he's gonna be talking about. So I've been seeing Mock Turtle is one of the tools that they are building and we internally are using it. In our, uh, in our flow and I know other tools like LS Oracle is also using it and it's getting very good results in comparison with ABC, which are the two main open source synthesis tools. So I'm um, very interested to see what are the new contributions. So you can go ahead, I'll mute myself. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and um, I will just share my screen here. Um, Okay, so hopefully you can hear me and, and see my, my slides. So my name is Heinz Wiener. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in EPFL in Switzerland. Um, we work on a project now for three years, which is called the EPFL Logic Synthesis Libraries. And this is a collection of, of different libraries, so modular libraries that we can put together. Um, everything is open source in order to solve um, logic synthesis problems. And currently our biggest library is called MockTurtle. Um, everything is implemented in C++. Um, and I'm only talking about this one library, which I just mentioned every now and then a few others, but it's mainly not important, but the libraries are designed to be um, composed together. So some tasks are basically outsourced um, to, to other libraries. Okay, and uh, the best overview you can get if you just go to the, to the GitHub link of our project. So I just posted um, the link actually in the chat below. So you can click on that and see, see exactly this page that I just show you here now on the slides. And um, this slide will tell you roughly what Mocktail actually is. So Mocktail is a C++ 17 logic network library. And this means it provides basically for you implementation of logic networks something like anti inverter graphs, majority inverter graphs, um, k-feasible lookup table networks, some other networks, um, and generic algorithms that can apply for, so generic algorithms for logic synthesis, logic optimization tasks that you can apply to these networks. Here on the, on the bottom, you see a little bit of code, which gives you roughly idea, an idea on, on how the style is, um, how we implement. Um, I don't want to really explain this example because in a, a few slides later, I will show you another example, which is a bit more interesting, um, also simple and a bit more interesting. And then I will just go over all the details. But what is maybe interesting here on the top, um, so we, we put a lot of effort actually in making Mock Turtle usable for other people. So we have continuous integration. We try to make it work on Linux, on OS X, on Windows. Um, we try to, to run code coverage tools, so you can see even the code coverage currently is not good. We are 79%, we should fix that very soon. So go up here again. Um, we have some documentation which is automatically gener generated from the source code. Also here we put actually a lot of uh, effort into making the documentation very good. Not always everything uh, works out, so also here we can improve it a little bit, but we put a lot of effort into that. And last but not least, um, everything is in MIT license. This means um, you can integrate it even with um, commercial other tools without even asking us. And uh, this is important for us, so people from commercial domain can also use this, this library. Okay, so um, 
If you come from the field of logic synthesis, then you may be familiar of other tools in this domain. And maybe the most important tool um, is ABC in this domain, which comes from UC Berkeley. Um, this is a logic synthesis and verification tool. It's industrial strength, so it has very fast uh, and scalable algorithms. It's completely implemented in C. Um, and our tool um, is not, so we don't really provide a tool. Um, we provide a library in conversion to ABC, so ABC is completely standalone. Our tool is a library um, which you can integrate with your own research project. So it's never really meant to be, to be standalone, it's just for you to integrate. And we never really had this, this, this aim of being industrial strand. We just, um, we tried to have a tool which we can use in order to do new research um, and make it very easy and flexible to, to try out new things. Um, of course, we have a little bit uh, this idea we can look in how is ABC designed in order to be fast and scalable and we try to be um, not much behind. So we try to be as fast and scalable as ABC. Not every time this really works so is, is really the target, but, but we put some effort there. And now since we want to be flexible and easy to customize, uh, we don't want to implement everything completely from scratch. Um, we decided not to implement in C, but in C++. And since the project is very, uh, very recent, so we, we started developing as uh, three years ago, we tried to keep um, best development practice right from the beginning. We tried to do testing, we tried to do documentation. Whenever we have time, we do code reviewing, a um, couple of other things. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we tried to, to make uh, development really, really good. Okay, so what can MockTurtle offer you? So if you've never heard of this project, um, it's a logic network library, and our main goal is um, technology independent logic synthesis. And what this library gives you um, is an abstraction mechanism for network types. So the idea is you define your own logic network, or you can at least easily build your own logic network if you want. So you can specify some gate types that you, that you want to use, and you get generic um, implementations of algorithms that you can apply to this, to your own um, defined logic networks. So this is very abstract. So that, let me try to be more concrete. So a user can define his own network type by implementing a so-called abstract network interface API. And this abstract network interface API, this is mainly just a, a convention. So the, here I'm not talking really about code. This is more a convention about how you should call certain methods, which parameters these methods should take and what they should return and what are their expected semantics. And if you follow these this conventions, then you can use some already existing algorithms because these algorithms, they expect uh, a network type which has exactly this, uh, these conventions implemented. And if these conventions are uh, satisfied, then the algorithm works on this network type. Okay, for example, a convention could be there's a, a create, um, when you, whenever you wanna create a primary input in your logic network, then this should be called create PI. And I think it doesn't take any parameters as well. Okay, and when you create a primary output, then there is a convention that this method should be called cre uh, create PO and so on. If you want to create a logic end gate, then this method should be create end. Um, if you want to iterate over nodes, then this, um, this iteration principle should be called for each node and so on and so on. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so the network interface API gives you conventions, how, how, um, how your net, network type should be designed in the end. And now we can implement algorithms generically just by using these interface API methods. And now these these uh, algorithms, they're completely uh, decoupled from the implementation details of uh, how the network internally um, is designed and, and they work. And now um, a combination actually of a network type and an algorithm, they work together if um, the, the network type imp um, implements all the API methods required by an algorithm. And this actually gives you a very high degree of composability. So you can put now together um, logic. So you implement the logic synthesis algorithm once, and it works now for all the network types which um, follow these naming conventions, implement all the API methods that are actually needed by the algorithm. 
and you get the separation of uh, network type and algorithm that makes the code typically very delicate. Okay, um, this slide basically just says the same thing as I said already, but I want to say it twice actually because it's easier to, to follow. So here you see kind of so the same, same idea again, represented as a four layer model. You see here in the bottom, there's this um, network interface API uh, layer. This is kind of naming conventions. This is just a uh, text. It's not implemented. It's just a textual description how your interface method should be called. On top of that, now you can write an algorithm which just uses these network interface API methods. And now you can write um, network implementations and these network implementations implement the network interface API. And now you can put network inter, uh, implementation and algorithms together. And once you instantiate this um, together, um, it will work if you provided all the methods that are required for the algorithm. On top of that, you could even say, so before I said, you cannot really um, leverage any implementation details, some, some uh, from, the, from, the, from the network. So you cannot really misuse this, this interface API. Some people may want to misuse the, the, the so they may take, uh, they wanna take advantage on how a network is implemented really to be performance, uh, to, to have some performance speaking. And if you really, really want to need this, then you can put this even on top of this model where you specialize some algorithms um, by leveraging some details of the network implementation. But we did it once actually in our whole project and otherwise we, uh, we always kind of um, don't really need this feature. So if you wonder how is this realized, um, as I said, we implemented in C++ and everything here is implemented with um, template made programming. Here. In, uh, in specifically, we use uh, a technique which is called concept-oriented uh, design. This is something which will be even supported in C++ in, uh, in C++ uh, version 20. Um, however, our library is still implemented in C++ 17, so we kind of mimic this mechanism of concept without actually having the keyword features from C++ yet. Um, if you're really interested in this idea, then you can read it up in Scalable Generic Logic Synthesis. It was published in Tech 2019. Okay, I'm going to show you some example code here. Um, uh, yeah, so this is a very, a very quick example. So, um, begin, you choose a network type. I said in the beginning, you, you should provide your own uh, user specified network type, but of course we have some pre-implemented network types, which just mimic the standard network types that we have in logic synthesis. For example, an anti-murder graph. In order to get an anti-murder graph, you just say, I want to have an anti -murder. So you have to include the right header, then we say we want an anti-murder graph network, and we call this anti-murder graph network AIG. I could now, uh, now call the interface API methods for creating PIs, creating gates, and so on. But um, this is too lengthy for this example. So let's just read a network from a file. So I want to read the network from the file um, ARG. And I want to store this in, this in this ARG network here. And I use here for the first time an external library, which is called Arena, which is our parsing library. We have it, uh, so we kind of we outsource all the, the parsing input output to the stuff from Mock Turtle to other libraries um, because it's more flexible and easy to, to fix bugs and errors in, the, in that case. Okay, so we have our network. We have our network, our graph data structure read into this, uh, into this network. Now we can apply a logic optimization algorithm to the ARG. In this case, this is cut rewriting, and cut rewriting gets a specific um, strategy for optimizing, which is called exact ARG synthesis in that case. And uh, note that here is ARG in this name. So this synthesis strategy is ARG specific again. So we have now the ARG network, which is ARG specific basically. Um, cut rewriting is a generic algorithm, but the synthesis strategy itself is ARG specific again. So this will only work on an ARG. Okay, now we did some logic optimization. Let's do a little bit more. So we wanna do also some uh, mapping for, for FPGAs, not, not mapping basically. Um, we define a mapping view. I don't really wanna explain what this is, just accept that there's a mapping view now. And we apply a LUT mapping algorithm to the mapping view. There are some default parameters which tell you how big the LUT should be and so on. And what you get from that is already a LUT mapped uh, network in the end. And now um, we do a little bit of 
pretty printing in the end, we iterate over all the nodes in the in the in the logic network. So we call this for each net uh, for each node function. This looks a bit uh, um, complicated if you have never seen this before. This is a lambda function which operates on one parameter, which is in that case a node. So this is just a function basically which, uh, without having an explicit name. So this for each node uh, function takes another function which is called basically on each node. And we ask this node, is this um, node in the mapped ARG the, the root of this, the, the root basically of the sen? If yes, then we print it uh, is finite. And that's it. Otherwise we don't do anything. Okay. Um, Yes, and now remember what I said before. So what you get from this is you can define uh, an ARG network, a network type, right? Then we have generic algorithms which can work on this, on this ARG type if certain naming conventions are satisfied. Um, and now here, um, ARG network has to satisfy all the, 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 has to implement basically all the API, uh, network interface API functions required by IGA reader has to implement all the network interface API functions required by cut rewriting. It has to implement all the, the interface network API function required by LUT mapping. And it has to implement the for each node method here. Um, and, uh, and mapping view has to implement its style root and for each style fanny. Okay, if this is, if we have another network type now, which also implements all these functions, we can just um, switch it, right? So we can drop the ARG network, we, can have, uh, we take a MIG network. If the MIG network implements the same methods, then everything works completely generically. Um, so the one thing that I have to change here is the MIG network. The second thing that I have to change is actually the recent thesis function. So it's not possible now to use an ARG recent thesis function and MRG. We need something which is specifically um, um, specific for, for MIG, and in the case is MIG and PN recent thesis. Everything works out of the box. Okay, let's let's dive one layer a little bit deeper. Um, how how does how does this really work inside? So let's look in one algorithm, a different one again, and let's look into the resubstitution algorithm. Um, you will find this one in Mocktail algorithms MIC resub HPP. Um, and here on the bottom, so you see uh, lots of commands. And here on the bottom, you see a little bit cut off the, the algorithm, the head of the algorithm, basically, or the, the prototype, or no, basically the, the head of the function definition. And uh, the, the function is called meager resubstitution. It gets three parameters. And the first one is an NTK, and this is a template parameter. And this means basically you can pass you whatever I want. And on this template parameter, I call a couple of, of methods. And these methods are listed here. All the methods that the algorithm calls. So it calls, for example, for each gate, for each node, get constant, get node, is complemented and so on. And if all these methods are provided by this template parameter that is, that is here, and it implements the expected, um, expected semantics for these methods, then this Mikuri substitution algorithm would work um, completely out of the box. And you can use um, one of the predefined uh, network types for that or any other network type that you uh, come up by yourself. Okay, I wanna um, draw your attention here to two of these. One is um, for each fan out. Um, and the other method uh, is, uh, the other network interface method is lever, okay. These two are important. Um, recognize that these are in, these, in this list here. Okay, so let's try to instantiate this algorithm. We make a new MIG network. Again, we read in an MRG from a, from a file um, with the IGA reader. We call the resubstitution algorithm. We provide default parameters, default statistics, where some, uh, some results, something like um, time, how much the runtime is, is stored, how much time this resubstitution algorithm takes. And now we compile it on the shell. So I just call make on the MIG resubstitution project, um, and then I get some, something back. And in that case, my compiler tells me this code doesn't compile. Um, it tells me there's a static assertion violated, blah, 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 blah. And somebody says, um, network does not implement the level method. And then I get even second error, and it says something like, network does not implement the for each final method. And this means that my, my, um, my, net, my network types, so my, my MIG network, 
does not implement actually all the, uh, all the network interface methods that the MIGRI substitution algorithm uh, requires. Okay, too bad. This means that we have to add um, two more methods basically to the network interface idea. Okay, however, there's a different concept in, in Moctel, which is called Fuse, and um, I want to just give you an idea on what that can do for you. Um, and Fuse, you can use um, to decorate a network type. A few can add, remove, or change functionality of a network type. And the few, so the few is wrapped around of the network type, and the few behaves um, afterwards exactly like, the net, like a network type itself. So you can pass it wherever you have a network type. And there are a couple of interesting views that, that are provided. Actually, there are many, many views which are provided, but these are maybe the easiest one to understand. So there's the, the top of view, it, it overrides the for each method and guarantees you that the nodes now are visited in topological order if your original network type did not guarantee that. There's the dev view. Uh, so this one, so the first one, the top of view actually changes one of the functionalities, um, one of the API interface um, uh, functions. The dev view um, implements um, two new uh, interface API methods. Uh, this is level and dev. So for each node, you can ask now um, what is the logic level of this node? How far is it away from the primary inputs? Um, fanos view implements the for each fanos method. So now you can iterate about the fanos of each of the nodes. Mapping view, I don't really want to explain, but you see already you need it for that mapping in the end. Emo table view. Is an example of a of a few which removes some methods from the from the interface. Um, it kind of removes all the methods which uh, which can change the, the network type. So you get something then that, uh, that is kind of constant out of that. So you cannot change this uh, this network anymore when you wrap this around. And then there's, for example, CNF view which can automatically create um, CNF so clauses from your from your gates. Whenever you add a gate to your network, you automatically get the clauses. And there are some methods where you can ask, okay, what are what is the variable that this uh, this uh, this gate maps to, and so on and so on. Okay, so how do we fix our example? Um, we and we include that view. We include panel view. Um, we wrap that view around the MIG. Now we get level basically as an additional method uh, for our for our dev view. Actually, uh, when we instantiate this here, some computation happens. So this takes some time. This is why we don't do it in the in the beginning because some of the algorithms may not need level information, so we don't need to compute it every time. Now we wrap fan out view around of uh, of, the, of the dev view. Now we get additionally the method for each fan out. Also, this takes some time to compute in the in the beginning. And now we can pass the fan out MIG um, to the MIG substitution algorithm. We compile, everything works, and it's fine. Okay, so I just realized that I have to hurry up a bit to stay in time. So, what are the highlights of Mocktail that we can give you? Um, it gives you basically this abstraction layer that you can define your own network types in a, in a very easy way. But of course, we have a couple of very common predefined uh, implementations of network types like ARGs, MRGs, XRGs, XMGs, KDOT networks. But this is actually not the strength. The strength is that you can just come up with your own network type if you want to. Maybe you want to have max gates somewhere, and then you want to just define a new one of these, of these guys and just have some random combination of gates because for some reason you believe this is the, this is the better data structure. Then you don't have to redesign, um, you redevelop basically all your optimization algorithms. You just have to custom, you just have to implement the, the core data structure and all the algorithms that we have already work out of the box. Um, we have uh, this network interface API. Um, mostly it's combinational. We have a little bit of extension for sequential because some of the people required it. Um, and we have tons of algorithms actually now already. Um, we have uh, network simulation, cut enumeration, dot mapping algorithm, node phase and thesis algorithms. Um, we have a couple of standard logic optimization algorithms like rewriting, refactoring, resubstitution, balancing. There are some algebraic optimization algorithms specifically for, for MIGs. We have some uh, techniques for computing don't cares. We have CNF generation, equivalence checking. Um, uh, things then some decomposition algorithms which can be combined with node synthesis uh, strategies. There you can do some couple of interesting things. Um, you find a lot of the technical information in the documentation. For example, you can look up the network implementation and you will uh, see in which header are, the, are these networks defined. 
um, what interface methods um, do the individual networks provide to you? So you would say, can get constants implemented by all and so on, and then there are a bit more complicated um, interface methods which are not provided by all the networks anymore. Um, we have a couple of research projects realized with Mocktail. So we, we work in logic uh, synthesis and technology mapping. So these are our core domains. We are sometimes a little bit interested in physical design. Also, we are a little bit interested in uh, interfacing with high level synthesis tools, but this is not really our, our target. So mostly it's logic synthesis. Um, currently, there, there are a lot of majority. So I believe we have the best majority logic synthesis algorithms in this tool, um, which are out there at least in, in, um, in open source tools. Um, I talked a lot about this generic logic uh, synthesis algorithms. Um, we have a couple of set-based exact synthesis engines. There are some algorithms for, for cryptanalysis, which can compute multiplicative complexity and multiplicative depth of logic networks. We put some effort into, because other people in our lab do that, um, we put some, end, inter, um, some, some effort into interfacing this tool with um, quantum combination flows. Also, there's some new work coming up where we try to target specifically superconducting technologies. Um, there's not so much time to talk about that. So I just want to give you a, quick, a few quick pointers here now. Um, so let's say you are really interested in this mock data project. How do you get started with it? Easiest way, you go to a GitHub repository and just go on it and try it out. Second easiest way is, you can learn more about, um, about this project just to go, uh, by going to the documentation and reading up on what um, algorithms exist. You put some effort into, um, into documenting that. Um, and there's also one more repository, which is called the LSI Showcase re Repository. This is not specifically only for, uh, for Mock Turtle, but it, it shows how, we, how, how different, um, different libraries, um, different of the different logic libraries can be composed together to solve some simple problems. So that you will find some example code in this, in this part. And there's, um, there's a paper on archive. Um, it's currently in its version two, um, which is called the EPFL logic synthesis libraries. And you will also find the short part here on, on mock and how it works. And you see there are a couple of other people. So this is not only uh, that I de developed here everything. There are a lot of other people involved who contributed code and even also external people who contribute. Okay, so brings me already to my conclusion because I'm already late. So I showed you Mocktail, the logic synthesis library, actually the C++ logic synthesis library. Um, it gives you an, um, an abstraction, it gives you abstraction mechanisms to um, describe network types. And then um, to give you a way to describe generic algorithms that can um, work on all these network types. Um, it has documentation testing with some micro benchmarking even for some parts, continuous integration, version control, um, right from the beginning. So we tried to design it in a good way. Um, actually it's a header only library, so it should be easy to integrate into other projects. Um, so there are some small dependencies. So it's almost free from dependencies, except for some small um, lightweight libraries, which we directly integrated into projects. So if you clone our mock turtle project, you would get these libraries too. And then it should be easy just to, to include um, the, the required, uh, required libraries. Everything is implemented in a, C++, in a modern C++ way, um, and it should be flexible and easy to use and should be customizable for your research projects. And uh, this brings me already to the end. And I uh, um, want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. So there is any question, any short question? We're running a little bit over time, but it's, uh, we can manage. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I no problem. So one thing I I was hoping to, to see, but I didn't see, is any comparison in the speed or quality of results with ABC. Uh, in our case, we ran some things. But of course, it's our flow with our things, so it's not clear. Do you have some place in which you've been running and trying to to see in what? Sometimes one is going to be better, sometimes another one is going to be better. It's not always going to be systematic. But on what it was better, what was worse? Well, I have to admit, we don't really compare systematically, but 
asset. So usually it's uh, the target is here not to have a complete industrial uh, style um, tool, right? So performance is not so important for us, except for some interesting research projects. And um, so for the research projects where we actually use this tool, we do performance benchmarking there. We try actually to optimize as much as possible. Okay. Usually um, the, the performance should be, um, so if the, if the heuristics are implemented in the same way, the performance is almost one-to-one. -one. Like for example, so there's no exactly disadvantage from using C++ over C, for example. This, uh, okay. Yeah. But um, so where the, the, the heuristics are designed in different way, then you see some, some performance uh, difference, of course, as well. Okay. Because exact synthesis, is it there in ABC or not? ABC doesn't have exact synthesis. Well, it that depends a bit, right? So the ABC is true. It doesn't have a really an integrated SAT-based exact synthesis engine, I think. But some of the databases which are generate, which are used in ABC, they, they have been generated with enumeration tools, which kind of is uh, is a similar approach. Then, uh, so it's it's something similar that exact synthesis can do for you. Okay, so thank you. So and we for go on the fly yeah. exact synthesis, anyways, it's it's too slow. So you wouldn't do um, let's say six cut rewriting with exact synthesis. It would not work. Okay. <laughs> So okay. we'll move to the next speaker, uh, Sheng. Uh, hey, uh, Chris has a question. Uh, there is a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just I did the raise hand thing, hopefully. Uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, my question on, um, on the, the synthesis um, presentation was, so there's a very large input space, and then there's a vi very large algorithm space, and there's a very large technology mapping, uh, like underlying cell library space. So what's your strategy for effectively testing that very large combinational space? Uh, yeah, I have to admit, we don't really, we don't really try to tackle all this space. Uh, so there are some research projects which are interesting for us. So we, we, we are university here, right? So we, we write papers. And when we develop something new, then we, we have usually some specific scenario in mind, right? So there's some specific technology which is interesting, which we want to achieve, uh, and we want to, let's say, apply certain optimization algorithms in this, in this domain. And um, we have in mind what kind of intermediate data structure might be the best one or what we want to compare, and these comparisons we do. So there's no um, systematic, um, I don't know, list of, of conversions between all these, all these things. Now, the problem is also is our library, it offers an enormous um, possibility. Uh, yeah, due to the, the composability, there are so much um, possibilities to compare algorithms and we, we never tried everything out. Cool, thanks. And, and of course, you can just um, come up with your own ideas of, I want to try uh, this combination and see which one is better, right? Right, right, thanks. Okay. So. Yeah, so I, I was mute, sorry. So let's move to the next speaker, Shank, who is a, my PhD student and you see Santa Cruz and he's working on Life at Sea. So go ahead. So can you hear me? Yes. So, um, yes. Can, yeah, okay. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our cruise session. And uh, my name is Chen Hong Wang. I'm currently a fourth year PhD student in UC Santa Cruz. My advisor is Jose Reno. Today I'm going to talk about our hardware development flow, Life XD. So first I will quickly go over the our research problem about LiveHD and the background of LiveHD. Then I'll talk about the two essential intermediate representation that we are using. The first one is LNAS, and then the second one is LGRAPH. Then I'll talk about the updates of LiveHD and our next targets. So before I join UC Santa Cruz, I'm currently, I, I, before I join UC Santa Cruz, I was an ASIC designer in Novatech. And Novatech is a design house in Taiwan, which focuses on building the driver IC for your smartphone. I still remember when I was the RTO coder, I need to 
uh, put my RTO design into logic interface and uh, give the backend engineer to do the trace and routing. But this whole flow will take several hours. And then as a human being, sometimes I will make some mistakes. So the whole flow has to go again, and it's another several hours. And as a whole team, we have several bugs need to fix. So all in all, we have to go through the hardware compilation flow multiple times, and usually takes days to weeks. So imagine you are a software developer and the compiler tells you the compilation will take you 10 hours, you will think it's just insane, right? But unfortunately, this is the current situation that our development faces. So luckily, my advisor, Jose Reno, was the one to address this problem. So we start to build a new hardware development flow. We call it LifeHD. So LifeHD is focusing on building an incremental and a scalable hardware design framework. For incremental, we want to get uh, design feedback within seconds if you are only just, in, just uh, doing some small code changes. For scalable, we want to deal with large design with linearly uh, time, not exponentially. So, so far, two of our alumni, uh, Rafael and Blake, have implemented several lab techniques and we got several publications for both simulation synthesis and visual place and writing. And start from me, we start to build an LLVM-like infrastructure, and we start to uh, work on our IR, LGraph, and LNAST. So currently, there are a lot of open source EDA hardware tools. I'm not going to iterate each of them, but uh, there are languages and uh, IR that those language using and some front-end synthesis tools and back-end tools. Here I build a table to briefly compare some famous hardware intermediate representation. The bottom one, bottom one is the LifeHD using and uh, as far as we know we are the only one who focus on building the incremental uh, feature. And we also carefully craft for speed for the large scalable design. So LiveHD is a framework which could perform in both simulation synthesis and FPJ plus and routing. Okay, so now talk of, about uh, why we want to build our own intermediate representation, LGraph and LNAST. This is because we want our LiveHD to be incremental so we could get uh, feedback within few seconds, lively. And we, want care, we care about the speed, so we want to have a scalable framework to build in any size of design. And we want to be general to deal with different languages in both front-end and back-end. And maybe more importantly, we want the open source code access, so which means this basically rule our every industry tools. So we want, we start to building our own IRs. Okay, so now talks about the high level IR LMS and low level IR LGraph. So here is a um, briefly uh, framework for LiveHD. LiveHD using LNAS to interface different front-end languages such as Perto and Pyro and we are start working on system dialogue interfacing. After all these language translates into LNAS format, um, we perform a translation from high-level LNAS to low-level LGraph. Then start from LGraph, we could do many um, logic synthesis or present routing or simulation passes. We also have integrated several tools, including the master code. And then at the back end, we generate the low level LNAS from LGraph, then start from this LNAS, we perform the code generation for different from different language, including C. So LNAS means language neutral abstract tree. And if you are using LNAS library to interfacing your uh, HDL, you are um, we are able to using the LNAS library to interface different languages 
and then building the power strip by using the common library. Same happens as the backend, using the same library interfaces to generate several language out. The LNAST IR itself is a tree structure, and the, the, this tree structure are able to capture some high-level semantic from different functional languages, like if else and tuples, loops, or functions. So we put a lot of effort to build the LNAST API documentation. So feel free if you, you are interested to bridging your favorite HDL into live HD framework. So now I talk about the uh, low level LGraph IR. So LGraph is a common data model for synthesis and simulation. So the most important most importantly, like LGraph using a memory map library, and this library is carefully crafted for speed. So it is very fast, and uh, we are able to avoid carbon sun fire IO by using this unified data model. So here are some benchmarks which try to compare the LGraph memory memory map library with the C++ standard library. So here in the orders of millions of nodes in the vector container, the LGraph library is faster than the standard library. And uh, for the uh, hash map container, this nearly vertical line is the C++ hash map. And uh, LGraph memory map library is far faster than that. We could achieve almost the same speed as the Google Upscale flat hash map, but we also have an extra feature, which is a memory map automatically. Okay, so this is a very brief introduction for um, LNAS and LGraph IR. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, LiveHD update uh, this year. So start from this year, we get two papers accepted related to LiveHD. The first one is accepted to IEEE Micro Magazine on agile and open source hardware issue. And we also have a live scene paper accepted by ISPAS and it's got a best paper nomination. So feel free to check it out. And Professor Jose Reno also has several outreach talks he talks about uh, IROP at the DAC this year and the LiveHD at Intel and Red Hat Research Days. For myself, I finally passed my PhD advancement. And start from this summer, I'm focusing on building the PyROP compiler design and try to interface LiveHD with Crystal and Fertile Frontend. And I'm doing a lot of paragraph optimization and I start to help on. Um, uh, multi language code generation. So now let us briefly discuss what is PyROP and why we care about it. PyROP is our in-house uh, hardware distribution languages. For the language-wise, PyROP focuses on building global type inference um, the attributes. For example, we are focused on building the bit width attribute to make it global type global type inference flow, which means we don't need to declare the bit width for every variable of every wire, so which could save the developer a lot of work. And we also want to embed it in the fluid pipeline syntax, so which we could do in some design exploration about uh, latency sensitive circuit. PyROP itself has an elegant syntax, so which means we have less lines of code and uh, we are able to express high-level object-oriented design. But more importantly, PyROP is building upon LiveHD infrastructure, which is LNAS and LGraph IR. So PyROP compilation could naively have live and scalable compilation flow in the future. And the PyROP could generate the C++ code to perform a simulation directly without generating an intermediate zero code. The PyROP compiler also allows custom passes. For example, we have 
working on building a um, passage we called punch, which is basically you could query a um, signal from your another hierarchical module, and the compiler will uh, build a corresponding I/O for along the hierarchical passes for you. So the user don't need to open every module in the hierarchical passes to just type input foo or input bar for every module it visits. And then since PyRobe is built upon the LiveHD framework, so which means we could generate the Verilog and maybe you could edit some Verilog code and parsing into LiveHD framework and then generate the PyRobe code again. So which means um, we, so based on this um, closed loop flow, we have uh, came about some formal verification idea for the LiveHD compilation. So, which is an interesting and exciting idea of, about LiveHD and Python compiler. So, start from this summer, we moved to a faster C++ parser, and then we have building more and more syntax about Python uh, languages, including arithmetic if else condition scope handling, synchronized circuit description, and the uh, generic uh, tuple type, objective event design, and uh, function definition and function code. For the compiler optimization, we have implemented uh, a copy publication and global good with inference for variable and that code element I mentioned. So here is a, a benchmark about our Pyro C++ parser. We compared with the users which try to pass in the Verilog code into the IR that users using, RTL IR, and then translate this RTL IR into LGraph. So we are passing a design with a 100,000K exclusive all chain. And um, the, pyro, uh, the new Pyro parser are able to pass in the design into LNAS and translate into uh, in five seconds compared with 21 seconds from the user's flow. Here is another design, um, 100,000 added trend, and uh, again, the pile flow could achieve within one second, but the user's flow will take around 11 seconds. Besides the pile compiler, I'm also collaborating, collaborating our master student Hungry Kaufman to interfacing Chisel protocol with the LiveHD framework. So here are a benchmark with about the two flow comparison. Here LiveHD and the Fertile Compiler framework both using the Google portal bar uh, to serialize and deserialize the fertile IR. LiveHD using uh, LiveHD translates the protobuf into LNAS and to LGraph, and then performing some optimization, including like what I said, um, the copy publication and deal with inference, then generating a very low code. The uh, original fertile compiler framework, which is a um, framework from UC Berkeley, they are doing some fertile compiler optimization and generating the Verilog code out. For a design for, for 500,000K, the LiveHD are able to, the LiveHD flow is able to get, it, get the result from, from 56 seconds. Uh, the original compiler framework will take around 200 seconds. So, which means the LiveHD core, core base is is very optimized for the speed. Okay, so now, besides the compiler and uh, interfacing with Virtual, we are also performing a code generation. We have building a passage to translate the low-level L graph into a low-level L mass. Then, start from this low-level L mass, we are start working on generating multiple languages. So now I talk about the LiveHD targets for our next few months. First, we are start 
to work on building a new parallel compilation flow. And since the two IRs, LNAS and LBR, that LiveHD using a sort of mature right now, so we are starting to working on importing our previous uh, light papers from the Ruby prototype into our faster C++ code base. And we are have a new PhD student who are starting to work on this feature. And then we starting to using Slam to parsing the system develop and translate to the LNAS. So the LiveHD is going to start to interfacing with the system develop. For the pyro compiler, I'm still going to build more and more syntax, including the memory support and the fluid syntax. And I will develop my next research idea about fluid simulation. Okay, so now briefly talk about what is fluid simulation. It tries to build a fast power simulator from the fluid pipeline that's described by Pyro. So what is fluid pipeline? Basically, it's a latency insensitive power design paradigm. So if instead of using traditional fluid flap to, to pipeline your conventional circuits, here in fluid pipeline, we are using a new flap. We call it fluid, uh, fluid flap. And this fluid flap they just has a, a synchronous time track uh, protocol inside. So between the stages, uh, the fluid flap can handshake with each other. And more importantly, since the handshake signal are asynchronous, so we are able to remove the fluid pipeline stages for free and very easily. So we call this, uh, we call removing the fluid pipeline behavior as the collapsing. So how could the collapsing help our fluid simulation idea? Before going to describe this idea, let's talk about the traditional arterial simulation. And for the traditional arterial simulation, it usually runs the simulation at kilohertz. But for some modern uh, emulator, it usually runs at least the speed at as megahertz. So if we are able to apply the fluid collapsing on our original RTL, we are able to get a faster emulator for free from the original RTL design. Then if we are running this fast emulator in speed of megahertz, for example, we are running the event of ABC very fast, and then we get the checkpoint from this ABC. Then we fit these checkpoint states to our lower RTO simulation. Then suddenly the RTO simulation are able to run the event of ABC parallelly. Then the RTO simulation could, could go from kilo megahertz, uh, kilohertz to megahertz. So this is the basic idea about fluid simulation. Okay, so the conclusion of today's talk, we have kept focus on building and optimizing like HD for fast and scalable code base. And then I, we also build a pyro compiler based on the live HD framework. And we are starting to interface in more and more languages like the system develop at the front end and the code generation at the back end. And we also, at the back end, we also generate C++ for our simulation and to explore our research ideas. Okay, so, any questions? I have a question. I did the hand raise thing, but I'll I'll just jump in. Uh, how does uh, I'm not familiar with this fluid flop idea. How does that compare to a latch based design? Um, so fluid pipeline are able to. Oh, my camera. So fluid, um, it's fluid pipeline could implement with two latches, or it, it's basically implement using. You could implement it using latch or a traditional flap. But these three flaps are 
have the handshake protocol. So it's basically two, two things between the fluid flap and lattice. But the flap using two lattice to compose the as a single fluid flap. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? So one, maybe we can, when I have some questions to compare with circuit and those things, but maybe we can leave it to later for when the circuit speaker gives the talk. Um, so if there are no more questions. Let me move to the next speaker, uh, Soba uh, from UIUC. Um, thank you for for accepting to give the talk. Uh, hi, Jose. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, are you able to see my screen and me? Yes, it's, uh, I, well, I see you in the, the screen. I don't see the screen, I see you. You don't see the screen. Okay, let me try again, one second. Now I see the screen. Okay, all right, so. Okay. All right, so um, should I start? Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. Thank you okay, for coming. So, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk here. Um, I am uh, at the ECE department at the University of Illinois. And uh, currently, I'm also uh, uh, visiting uh, Google Brain uh, for some of my research uh, that I'm going to talk about today that spans the relationship between verification, design verification, and machine learning. So this has been the mainstay of my research for the past uh, decade or so, and um, uh, I'm continuing it while in Google Brain. Uh, so unlike the previous two talks in the session, uh, this one is going to be more about the problem and the solutions that the tool, that the Goldmine tool has. Um, and uh, I I I, uh, ref, I would refer people who are interested in in the actual uh, options within the tool uh, to our website, <clears throat> where we've tried to document a lot of this, as well as uh, a few talks that we have given on the tool uh, that are more similar to the ones that we saw earlier today, uh, that, that that talk about the different kinds of options that are in the tool and the different. Um, um, uh, uh, examples that you can run and uh, so on and so forth. So sorry that the, this is not that talk, but hopefully it'll still uh, capture what what the tool does and why we think uh, uh, it's relevant. Uh, okay, so uh, what is verification? Uh, verification is uh, figuring out if an, a design implementation, an RTL uh, design implementation, follows the specification in either an architectural document or uh, an English language document, uh, and so on and so forth. And verification has uh, there are many different artifacts like tests, assertions, and so on, which try which will uh, be which are used for verification. Uh, so who needs verification? <clears throat> well, it, literally every software, hardware, and embedded system engineered today needs verification. Uh, and verification tends to be the longest or, or the, the worst bottleneck, the toughest bottleneck of every such design cycle, whether it's hot so software, hardware, or embedded systems. The verification of it takes 70% of the time, and the design of it takes about 30% of the time. It's kind of the... Uh, 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 is kind of the thumb rule for how uh, how much of a bottleneck it tends to be. So why is verification uh, such a hard problem? I'll try to uh, summarize this within um, the slide. Uh, but uh, so if if a, a flip flop has uh, two states, uh, a 300 flip flop design has more states than the number of protons in the universe. And we build systems with many billions of flops. So it's two to the many billions, which is compute that we don't have, that, that we are not able to 
uh, achieve. So we build systems that we do not know how to verify, and that has been the case for very, very long. Uh, so if you have to go through the entire system and figure out uh, that it has that it is truly satisfying the specification, then uh, that is basically impossible for the amount of compute that we have today. So it has been uh, declared as a grand challenge of computer science, not you know for very long, uh, and has had a lot of Turing Award winners because of the complexity uh, of this problem. And uh, it turns out that as we keep on adding new features, you know, uh, lesser power, lesser, uh, you know, higher battery life, uh, more sleek, uh, better form factor, all of this comes at a price. And the price is basically the, the complexity that uh, the ver its verification entails. And uh, and and so so verification is basically a, a, a it's 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 a battle of scale, and. Um, figuring out how much to check and uh, how much can we check so that it can get out of the door because we definitely know that we cannot check everything. So uh, given that there's a lot of different challenges that uh, that verification entails, uh, scalability is one, uh, figuring out now, I, since I know that I cannot scale to the whole system, uh, I would limit it to figuring out how good, uh, how much of the system can I cover? So how good, basically, how good are my tests? Uh, I know that I cannot cover everything so i need to cover whatever is important or my tests need to be really good now so generating high quality inputs is very relevant uh, and then again how do i know when i'm done given that i cannot do the whole thing how do when do i call it you know like a pretty good uh, a pretty good effort and when do i move on right and similarly how do i know what to check for how do i generate good properties or assertions from the system uh, from the specification that i know should hold in the system uh, and then once i find that once i run my tests and i find that there's a failure uh, how do i uh, figure out what is the reason for the failure how do i figure out why 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 there was a bug across you know millions of simulations and can i replay the bug and so on so these are just some problems that i wanted to uh, motivate as to you know what are the kinds of questions that we think about when we are solving verification related issues. So this is what the area entails, and uh, in our research group, we basically have uh, uh, had have have uh, consistently been developing open source tools uh, that we have put out uh, in the in the community, and uh, I'm happy to say that many of them many of them are actually. Uh, uh, are, have been used very consistently by papers and by universities uh, and, and even by uh, commercial industry. So Goldmine is one that started out uh, as an assertion generation or a property generation tool. But at this point, we have tried to do much more with it than just assertion generation. So uh, if I get a chance, I will talk about that. Uh, we are also, so an offshoot of Goldmine is another uh, tool uh, which is also be able to uh, to identify how much coverage uh, a given uh, a given assertion has, and this is a this is a non-trivial problem because assertion coverage is something that is not uh, known to be a that is not very uh, formally quantified. So we developed a quantification that works that makes sense for uh, RTL designs, and uh, this is this ranking or this quantification that this this, uh, this quantitative measure or metric for uh, assertions is something that uh, that people consider very valuable while designing while while writing RTL design. So this there is a tool there is a tool there's an offshoot of Goldmine that uh, would that that is able to tell you given a bunch of uh, assertions what is the amount of coverage that you have achieved you can also do that with um, um, with with very complex assertions. <clears throat> it, there's, uh, we have another tool called Duplex, which we use for uh, the verification for analog and mixed signal verification. And uh, this is this is a uh, again uh, mixed signal verification um, is a very very complex problem, but but uh, duplex does not solve it does not formally attempt to uh, do a formal verification of analog mixed signal. It does uh, more of a uh, randomized search based simulation, and it uh, tends to be much faster than Monte Carlo based simulations, uh, like to the order of like hundred x faster, and that's basically the contribution of duplex duplex is also open source uh, generating high quality inputs as i mentioned especially for constrained random verification is extreme is very relevant that is the 
uh, state of the art in industry for generating for actually for designing systems for testing systems and hybro uh, so it, so the state of the practice in industry is that human beings come up with uh, certain constraints and then a random stimulus generator generates the tests the actual tests which is uh, which is uh, based off of the constraints or which is bounded by the constraints so it's called constrained random stimulus generation uh, what hybro does is that it generates the high quality inputs uh, on its own so it doesn't use this system of a human based constraint generation and a random stimulus uh, and a random number or a pseudo random stimulus generator instead it just combines all the pseudo random stimulus uh, does a much more directed search over the rtl design and then uh, tries to generate the uh, constraints plus the test by itself uh, we also have uh, a tool on post silicon validation and debug which is a, which is also open source and this is something that helps with trace signal selection as well as diagnosis in the post silicon phase so post silicon means that uh, that that this has already that that we that the verification is now black box because it's already in silicon and uh, it, it and and uh, so we don't have while we don't have the white box uh, simulation uh, advantage as we have an RTL uh, we have to basically stick with minimal with, with being able to uh, put the right signals on silicon so that we can trace back when there is a bug we can trace back to where the problem actually was and this is a very difficult problem uh, like all verification problems this is a very difficult practical problem uh, that we that we try to solve through uh, uh, through our tool uh, so uh, we also have a tool for uh, system level verification so uh, this is much higher than RTL level. So we are thinking about transaction uh, level like system C and uh, beyond. And at that transaction level, we are interested in verifying performance. So the issues are less about functionality and they're more about uh, if there was a performance violation, which uh, which part of my which IP should I look at or which part of the entire system is the reason why there is there is a performance bottleneck or a performance violation so we have a tool that does that as well so I encourage you very much to uh, look at uh, you know uh, to go to uh, our web page and uh, identify and, and so my web page or the group web page or even gold mines web page which I like which I'll show you the link for all of these tools are linked from there so you highly encouraged to use them uh, so I will talk a bit about what is uh, common to these tools and what why uh, we believe that they can contribute uh, significantly in doing uh, in solving these very difficult uh, problems uh, so one uh, so so one of the mainstays as I said of my uh, research has been that uh, the, the connections between finding connections uh, between verification and uh, good machine learning techniques and algorithms that could solve uh, these problems um, so here is an intu intuition for uh, you know why this uh, the, this this marriage between uh, verification and machine learning has led to so many tools and has led to so much of uh, has, has has helped us solve almost every one of the hard problems in verification uh, in a in a very uh, in in sort of in what in what is much more scalable than the predecessors of these tools. So uh, what? So, uh, so here is pro the intuition for it. So uh, we start. So if we think about gold mine itself, so the intuition is that if you uh, so in in the normal verification design verification, so much before uh, machine learning or any statistical techniques were applied to it, and I'm talking right now back in 20, 2009 when machine learning was not even uh, fashionable uh, because deep learning, the deep learning revolution had not yet happened. Uh, back then. Uh, uh, this is the intuition that we had that uh, the determinants so the traditional techniques to do verification or even synthesis or other such um, other such uh, tip, you know the CAD uh, methodologies were, uh, were were based on uh, using the entire RTL or the entire design basically the, the entire design model uh, as the as the uh, as sort of the oracle and uh, navigating that model 
uh, and navigating that model to identify if there are bugs or to identify if there are uh, you know if if there's uh, if there's an error in, uh, somewhere to that to identify if uh, how to uh, sort of uh, how to how to do performance optimizations whatever it is that design uh, model was basically the uh, was was considered was, was the one that was analyzed and this kind of static be design based analysis uh, is not scalable right it's a, that's what the, that's what the previous slides mentioned that, that this kind of a static analysis of every part of the design uh, so the gate level is particularly uh, bad but even at the rtl level uh, when when it's much more abstract still navigating through the rtl uh, across the different paths in order to generate tests or in order to identify bugs all of these are very are, are not scalable they are not scalable uh, methods uh, so the uh, so our intuition was that we should possibly uh, try to compromise on completeness on on exhaustive completeness, and uh, and instead use. Um, statistical methods that can basically uh, use a lot of the data i mean so we uh, when we design hardware uh, we have a lot of data right we have a lot of simulations that uh, that we do because that's the only thing that we really do to test this design so given all the simulations that's a lot of data so can we use all of those simulations in some smart way uh, so that we can make statistical uh, or pattern based or heuristic based inferences that we can then employ to do uh, more, you know, to 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 do bug bug detection or to generate patterns of uh, assertions or things like that. So the idea is that machine learning is scalable, but when it lacks context, it generates garbage, right? And uh, static analysis is not scalable, but it has the complete context. So if you combine these two, you can offset both their disadvantages, and uh, and and so and this. This principle has been very useful to us while we are uh, in, in all of the tools. And Goldmine, as I mentioned, has is being used by a lot of universities, a lot many researchers, and uh, also by a lot of companies. Uh, one of the EDA uh, uh, companies actually have uh, have uh, 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 have, have developed Goldmine. Uh, into a commercial product which has been uh, sold ever since i think 2012 uh, under a different name of course by the commercial company and uh, since all of this is open source uh, this is uh, so although you know the uh, we we have, we have collaborated with that company uh, we have still uh, the, we have reason to uh, be very proud that you know all of our uh, the different uh, undergraduate and graduate students who actually contributed to Goldmine uh, have uh, basically uh, generated something that is actually being used on uh, very real designs, even in a commercial uh, product. But uh, but our focus is to provide as much of open source support on this tool uh, as is possible. Goldmine can uh, generate assertions. It can do uh, ranking of assertions it also is able to do static analysis of of the uh, design so it can actually give you different symbolic interpretations it can give you coverage analysis it can do a lot of different rtl design analysis so please please go ahead and uh, uh, download it and use it and let us know if you would like us to improve it we have an active set of students that is working on it even now uh, so uh, going back to the connections between uh, verification and machine learning, so if you look at uh, uh, verification, which is basically the process of figuring out, given a model or given a, 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 a design, we want to, we, so, so the model uh, in the case of verification is this, is the design itself. And from the simulations, we are trying to uh, figure out if the simulations, if the data that we are getting out of the design actually satisfies the model or satisfies the property that, uh, that we want uh, the model to satisfy. Uh, machine learning is sort of the exact opposite of this. Because uh, when in, in machine learning, with, with, with no notion, notion of what that model is supposed to do, of what the design is supposed to do, simply from the data, uh, the, um, the machine learning uh, or the statistical tools try to infer patterns and guess an underlying 
uh, model, an underlying statistical model. So uh, given that there is this, uh, you know, it's kind of the exact opposite sort of uh, uh, methodology in reasoning. One of them is deductive, like verification is deductive, where you have, where you know all of the truth. And for every simulation, which is a, a single instance of that truth, you're trying to identify if that instance uh, is true or not. Uh, whereas this is inductive, which means that you do not know what the truth is, but you are using different uh, up different kinds of uh, examples or inferences to, I mean, different kinds of examples to come up with an inference. And if there is an example that breaks that inference, then you sort of uh, reevaluate the functionality and relearn a different inference. So one is inductive and one is deductive. And it's interesting that when you actually put these two together, so this is one architecture in which we are able to use gold mine. So if you actually, uh, so, so right here is a data generator, which is basically, the, you can think of it as a simulator, and that would simulate the RTL. And from the RTL, the traces uh, would be used for uh, any ML model. Here I've uh, uh, talked about the decision tree, which is a, one of the most simple, uh, like the decision tree or the random forest. And these are all very simple supervised learning algorithms, but uh, you can really literally plug in anything there. You can even plug in a deep neural network with the right bells and whistles. And uh, that's uh, actually, that's part of what we are working on right now. And uh, it, it, uh, it it works. It works pretty well. So the, uh, the thing here is that if you plug in your favorite ML model, right there with the simulation traces as data, then the inferences that it comes up with, which, which are called likely assertions here, but really they're patterns of the data, uh, there's two. So we had, we, you can use it in a couple of modes, but in the mode that, uh, that I have here, each of these inferences can be passed through a formal verification engine. So a formal verification engine like ABC, which was mentioned by Jose early on, is an engine which would be able to take an assertion and the RTL and basically tell you if this assertion is true on that RTL or not. So here, right here, you see the interplay of these two different technologies or these two different kinds of algorithms, right? So the decision tree building is the inductive algorithm, which looks at the whole bunch of simulation traces and comes up with an assertion or with a with a with with an inference about what is true for the traces that it has seen. Formal verification is is something that is deductive. It's using it in exactly the opposite way. It's kind of looking at the property and looking at the set of the complete set of simulations, which is what the uh, which is what it knows that the model should do. Like the entire truth table for that design um, is, and and it tries to figure out if this guessed assertion, if the guess by the machine learning uh, engine, is actually true. If it's true, then uh, you know that's that's a that's some feedback that uh, that it was true. Otherwise, if it's not true, it also gives you a counterexample, and the counterexample is able to. So, if you simulate that again, then now that contributes to new data, and you can do this uh, in the case of the decision tree. You can incrementally build that decision tree, or in the case of a neural network, you will incrementally change the weights of the network based on these counterexamples. What's interesting here is that 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 verification of whether an inference was correct or not. Uh, we, so we are not using formal verification here to actually verify the design. We are using it to verify whether that that guess made by ML was a good one or not, right? Uh, and you needn't use it, use formal verification. There are, as I said, there's multiple modes to use a uh, gold mine, but this is something that actually brings out this interesting interplay between these two types of uh, techniques. And when you do this iteratively, it turns out that uh, you're able to, that the ML engine, which typically is used to figuring out context entirely through data, uh, with this very close fine-grained feedback from the formal uh, from either the formal engine or a human being or whatever this kind of a very focused fine grain feedback is able to uh, get is able to converge on the design function very very quickly so we have used the same configuration without the formal verification in cases where you know it wouldn't scale formal verification wouldn't scale and uh, with even human feedback or even like a uh, you know a more uh, a more uh, a less uh, 
uh, a less exhaustive automatic feedback, uh, the function would, circuit function would, it would still converge to the design function. It would learn the design function, right? And so here are some results on um, uh, on a bunch of open source designs, uh, including uh, I think the uh, so so we have we have done these analyses on the OpenSpark. Uh, T2, we've done these analysis on the USB, on the PCI, and on multiple industry designs. So, uh, this, so basically, we are able to see that the, that the learning, even if you give it zero simulation, right? If you give it completely zero simulations, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you give it a few simulations with zero percent. Uh, coverage, close to zero percent coverage, or even with zero simulations, you it can actually within uh, about 15 iterations of this loop, it can get up to 100% coverage on a small module. Uh, and when I say small, it's about like the, the size of a uh, of a small like a risk processor kind of module, uh, a risk five processor kind of uh, module. If of course uh, when the sizes start to get larger, uh, this convergence takes much longer. But I think this is an this kind of takes us. It can go literally from zero to hundred. Uh, which speaks to the fact that how much it can learn because of the kind of directed feedback that we provide. So, uh, so I think that is that's a that's an interesting uh, uh, result. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. So some of the other so so one uh, insight from our research uh, in this past. Uh, you know, uh, the past nine or 10 years that we've done this is that there is a direct connection between how much of domain uh, information is provided to the ML engine and how well it does. So uh, arbitrary, uh, you know, off the shelf ML engines, which are just so, and, uh, you know, applying an SVM algorithm or one of the way call algorithms off the shelf is not really, uh, is. I mean, it's distinctly worse and much, much worse than uh, being able to uh, to provide the features that make sense for that task, for that particular task. Uh, and in the case of, uh, so this is true for machine learning in general, but in our case, in the case of verification, we have all these very interesting uh, 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 we have all these, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, this is the slide that I wanted to be on. So th we have these very interesting uh, analyses of things that we we, uh, we have access to because we know, uh, for example, we know how to build a control data flow graph for the RTL. So from that, we know how to do, uh, you know, things like, Symbolic simulation. Uh, we know how to do. Uh, we know how to do use def chain uh, analysis. We know how to get uh, like we, how to how to uh, analyze a data flow graph uh, for coverage. We know all of these things. Uh, we know that that we can uh, abstract. Uh, bit level uh, operations to word level. All of these things through research and verification, static analysis verification, we know already. So if we can actually grab those types of uh, abstractions or those types of uh, knowledge about the design, static design knowledge, uh, which I've called static analysis here, and we plug them in strategic ways into the uh, into the ML uh, engine, then we are able to basically get, even with random forest and decision tree, we are able to come up with new kinds of algorithms, which is what the A minor part of Goldmine does. Uh, we come up with new kinds of algorithms that are very specific to uh, that the tasks that we want, like de debugging or coverage uh, uh, or getting 100% coverage and things like that. Uh, so, uh, Jose, how much time do I have? One second. So. So you can go five minutes more. Okay, five minutes with questions. Okay. All right, thank you. So one more uh, thing that I wanted to uh, sort of uh, give you a flavor for. Uh, actually, you know, sorry, if I have just five minutes more, maybe I should uh, go to a different so uh, something else that I think you would find interesting. Okay, so here is a uh, post silicon debug in which we used ml techniques so in the ml techniques that we used for again going back to the same idea of grabbing through static analysis interesting 
aspects, the automatic static analysis to grab interesting aspects of the uh, problem so that ML can, can actually use it, right? So if you actually see, if you look at this, if this is the raw trace data for the post-silicon uh, simulation, uh, you, uh, you will find that the trace data in the raw feature space has no correlation. Whereas when you engineer these features to uh, actually, and this is all, all automatic, so when we say engineering, uh, we are not really uh, handcrafting these features, but we are basically engineering them according to what uh, what what uh, we know about the uh, design, right? And this could be done for any uh, for any design. These are uh, generic algorithms that we could use across any design. What happens is that if you you know you see over here that the classification is so much better because you can now say that uh, the, the the here is the normal behavior and here is the buggy behavior. The buggy one is an outlier, and that that uh, space is much more well-defined simply because of the features that we uh, picked. And uh, so that is uh, another, so that's an interesting uh, point that uh, we, we basically uh, managed to capture the buggy behaviors as outliers in the, uh, to the normal behavior. And this was possible because of the interesting features that we were able to uh, engineer. So what are the features? For example, uh, we, things like the uh, buggy message sequences are infrequent and they have a particular uh, a particular dev and they are deviant from the bug free message sequences. So we try to capture these two characteristics via the engineered features. And uh, so we had, uh, so there's, there's entropy and there's a couple of other uh, such uh, features that we tried to capture. And due to that, uh, the entire diagnosis problem or the debugging problem became much more tractable. Uh, so for example, <clears throat> this is a, so uh, the models that we used, again, these were not deep learning models. These were uh, uh, much, much simpler supervised learning models. And they uh, managed to uh, be, they, they, I think their precision was around the, between the 75 and 80% mark. And what that meant was that they were able to, uh, between 75 and 80% of the time, they were able to look at a trace and identify if this trace is a buggy trace or not right and uh, and if it was and that basically cuts down the amount of uh, uh, human uh, i mean sorry not just that it was a buggy trace but what is the reason for the buggy traces between 75 and 80 percent of the time they were able to identify the reason for uh, the bug in the trace and 25 percent of the time they were not which basically means that the human now has to put in only 25 percent of the manual effort whereas in <clears throat> in an uh, with, in the absence of these tools, uh, of this tool, uh, they would have to put in 100% of the effort to basically look through every bug and identify what's the problem. So, uh, so in other words, so if you look at this table, uh, the uh, between the manual and the automated, the amount of time that, uh, and these are, by the way, these are uh, not numbers that, uh, the manual numbers are not numbers from uh, our own um, research. These are numbers that other people have the people who have used this tool have provided us these are collaborators these are industrial uh, users industrial collaborators of the tool it is academic collaborators and we injected the bugs they had to find the bugs and the, the amount of time it took them to find the reason for the bug that is what we have recorded here as an average so over the time so the time of the, the time it took the human beings to find it was somewhere this the average time and uh, and in most of the cases they did uh, I think in some of the cases they didn't even diagnose it after all that time uh, whereas the automatic tool uh, diagnoses it at least 50% of the time but it takes far less time to actually diagnose it so uh, there are instances where the automatic tool uh, couldn't come up with the correct diagnosis but on an average it managed to uh, save uh, like 400x of uh, time that a human being would spend on it uh, so I think, yeah, this is the last slide about how, so we try to use uh, uh, neural networks for doing reachability analysis over RTL designs, and we actually find some very promising results because uh, we are, by using graph neural networks, we find that analyzing reachability, which is considered, uh, which, which is uh, considered sort of a level zero 
problem in verification, uh, that a neural network was able to find out starting from some node in the graph, uh, in the in the control data flow graph of the RTL, uh, whether it can reach any other graph or not. Uh, so with this, I think I will take questions because uh, I think I have uh, made the point that I wanted to make that uh, the connections that ML is a very very useful tool for uh, solving verification problems uh, because of the scalability that the statistical nature of ML brings in. But uh, the caveat is, or the, the research of it, is in identifying what are the good, what are the feet, how, how do you frame the ML tasks and what kinds of domain features can you provide in an automatic fashion so that it can actually scale to the kinds of uh, solutions that we have. That's it from me. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. Very, very nice, very interesting talk. Uh, one question I have, well, since there are questions, but while they are thinking the people, the questions, let me ask one. So you are showing data with coverage. Um, and one of the issues when we we doing over this is that line coverage is not so good. If you do toggle coverage, it might be too difficult to reach or makes no sense. Uh, and if you do cover, uh, cover coverage, you are dependent on the design designer creating the cover coverage points. Um, so one question is, what tools do you use for get, gathering all this information? Because we're talking about the tools. And what, is you, what do you do for the coverage? And what were you using on those plots? So, do you mean uh, the one, the coverage that we are reporting, like yes. the uh, assertion coverage? So, <clears throat> so assertion coverage is what we ourselves define. So, we are defining assertion coverage as, uh, you know, according to uh, according to whether an antecedent. So, given an antecedent and a consequent for an assertion, we define it as for uh, we actually analyze the RTL graph and say that wherever the antecedent is true, uh, if the consequent is also true, then the amount, the, uh, the places that the antecedent is true, like the, all the points in the graph where the antecedent is true, the condition is true, those are all the parts that are covered by that assertion. So this is not a standard definition. This is our own definition that we have uh, come up with. However, your question about coverage be saying that line and toggle are not, or even branch are not that useful. That is true, right? But in the so uh, none of those are useful metrics. The the fact that you know all of these branch toggle line uh, condition, all of these are only checking you know piecemeal things about the design. Uh, but when we when we report like starting from zero, we got hundred percent coverage. That is with respect to these metrics, unfortunately, because that's okay. all we have to go by. Yeah. So. Okay. No, that's good. And just curious, what do you, tools do you do to run simulations? Do you use commercial tools for gathering the coverage? No, we use iVerilog. iVerilog. So Ooh, that's that, that, uh, that's a little bit of the slow. No very later. iVerilog you use? Uh, so, sorry. So, so you use I very log, so that's going to be significantly slower than things like very later. So, but the one that you yeah, use is I very log. But I think the it's given that so many people uh, we want more people to use the tool, and there are many students in universities across the across like in there are students in Egypt and you know students in Japan, and they want to, if they want to use this tool, then. We cannot expect that they have access to all these uh, different, you know, VCS and all these others. So uh, that's the reason we use iVerilog. But I mean, if you're if you have other open source tool suggestions that are better than iVerilog, we would be happy to incorporate them. Yeah, very later. It's... Very later. Oh, that is open source. I see. That's I, I did source. not see that. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's okay. So that's better. a very good. Yeah. Okay. I should write that down. Yeah. I'll... I'll talk to you later. Maybe if there is some way that we can collaborate. And the other question is on the for reading the netlist and the RTL. Do you have an in-house flow or? Yeah. Because then we it's difficult to parse a complex, a complicated very log. It will have to be a subset very log or. No, there is something called pi very log, right? So okay. uh, pi very log is what we are using for. For that, but uh, but yeah, I think PyVerilog is is pretty good. We haven't written our own parser, uh, but we've used the PyVerilog parser, which is pretty good. Although there are, I think from time to time there are designs which it cannot parse, and we have to do some uh, modifications of our own. 
but i think yeah that it might be interesting to just talk about this offline anyway because I, it I may be that we have some uh, we are a bit outdated because we have been doing this for uh, the our tools were written about 6 to 7 years ago and we are kind of updating parts of it but it would be very nice to know what's new and out there that we can use okay thank you there is anyone else from another question Okay, so thank, thank you very you. much for, for the talk. Uh, one of my students is playing with a gold mine, so we'll see. Um, thank you. The next speaker is Chris uh, from Google. So he's going to be talking about the the new flow that you just released. Um, thank you very much for volunteering to give a talk. Thanks so much for having me. Let's see. Can everyone see the slides and hear me? Uh, yes, perfect. Excellent. All right, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm Chris Leary. I'm here today to talk to you about this XLS project that we've started. Um, we're a team inside of Google. We started off as like uh, two or three people, and we've grown to the team that you see here. And uh, we actually put our repository in open source recently. We didn't do a big blog announcement post yet. We were actually waiting until we had some additional features, but. Uh, Yeah, I guess word got out once the repository was openly visible. So uh, happy to be here talking to you all today. Um, so just who are we? Where are we coming from? Uh, so we were the team that previously built uh, the XLA compiler inside of Google. Um, that's now open sourced as part of TensorFlow, uh, but you know is relatively independent uh, compiler from TensorFlow in general. Uh, and so we were also Founders of the TPU software stack, so XLA serves as the primary way to program uh, TPU devices. Actually, the the only way from a high level uh, language like TensorFlow, and so we developed all the compilers and tooling for that. And we got this experience from the TPU software stack design and working closely with people on the hardware side. That this co-design and vertical integration uh, was really what made the TPU stack work extremely well and a great process uh, for development. And so we kind of felt like that TPU experience gave us some unique perspective on accelerator design that we could try to scale more because Google's all about the scale. Um, and so previous to that, we had worked on Google's CUDA compiler um, that's now open sourced as uh, CUDA Clang and uh, the CUDA OpenCL runtime that's used by TensorFlow. Um, and so after building this whole compute ecosystem from scratch, we were like, what's next? Uh, and so Then we decided we were going to try to start helping build the, the technology that launches a thousand accelerators. Uh, so that's kind of the origin story. And we started it in early 2019, and we do this fail fast thing at Google where we try to see, can we prove out the technology, see if there's a there there, if there's something interesting we could develop in this space that would really enable internal uh, use cases and potentially you know, broader industry use cases. And so as of our fail fast checkpoint, which was like May 2019, we had done a quarter and a half or so of prototyping. And we made this kind of interactive demo you see here. Because the idea was, can we bring software style methodology and development practices uh, and capabilities to people who are designing uh, ultimately hardware artifacts? Uh, and so we kind of saw this. And we're like, all right, this seems like it has promise. There's this instant feedback and code generation. You can test things and view what the output is as you type. Uh, we started on an automatic pipelining flow, which you see here. You can change the frequency, and then it changes the number of pipe stages that it ultimately produces. Uh, we were able to tie in uh, to our backend flow for ASIC development, and we had developed you know, these reusable pieces like a Verilog AST for code generation and the ability to emit uh, either a time multiplexed version of a feed forward computation or a pipelined implementation from the single source. So since then, that first fail fast checkpoint, the basics are still similar, but we made a bunch of improvements and we've taken on new frontiers. So you still fundamentally type a hardware description into this file or set of files, which are modules, and you describe actually synthesizable unit test vectors that run inline as part of the code. And then you can run uh, Basil tests. So Basil is our open source version of our build system, and everything is just a command line away. You can just do Basil test some target, and everyone can run that, and it runs as part of continuous integration. So uh, you can also create these fast external stimulus test benches driven by either Python or a C++ test bench. 
uh, and this also runs down through the code generation flow and runs against whatever simulators you have available. So in open source, we're using Icarus Verilog right now, but uh, actually contributions that had us use Verilator would be super welcome. Uh, so you in-house, you convert to Verilog by noting what process node you're targeting and what your latency and frequency requirements are. Uh, and then that produces a Verilog thing that you can then embed into your design uh, using you know, another build rule. So this is some SHA-256 chunk of code written in the DSL. And then that's the Blaze test target that uh, you can run. Uh, Basil test target, excuse me. So uh, we had kind of a funny experience with this because you know, following that checkpoint and being excited and talking to people, we noticed that uh, sometimes things go wrong where people go, oh, XLS, that's you know, about equal to HLS edit distance one. I remember some HLS thing that some bad experience or uh, you know, unfortunate result and then lie down, try not to cry, and cry a lot. So these reactions uh, are real and require consideration. And so we you know, had to do research to understand better where people were coming from and whether these uh, you know, reactions that people were having were essential or just incidental uh, with respect to HLS. So you know, we read the giant pile of books, uh, some of which uh, some of the people in this, uh, in this venue have helped to produce. And uh, you know, after reading all this and all the papers we could get our hands on and thinking really hard, drum roll, I'm still not exactly sure what HLS is. But I can identify a common theme, which is that HLS is about up-leveling the hardware design process where it makes sense. And that's very compelling from uh, a bunch of angles. But I think there's also proof that it's a spectrum between RTL and HLS, which is that we're designing an RTL mode for our HLS environment where you opt out of the multi-cycle facilities that it would provide you and constrain that each piece of the design could be exactly one cycle. So that would be effectively RTL mode. So that's just kind of a thought experiment to say, oh yeah, actually there's a continuum of benefits that you can get here. And so then people ask like, okay, what about generators? Are generators HLS? Are deeply parameterized libraries and smart IPs HLS? And I say, uh, I don't know, yeah, sure. That, that sounds good to me uh, according to that definition. But I think what's clear about this whole thing is that there's power in the infrastructure that can do heavy li lifting on demand and kind of un unify and generalize the infrastructure that you're relying on with capabilities. And so that's why we started building XLS um, and what we're doing. And so the motivation for this up-leveling of the hardware design process is we want more reusable building blocks. We want to be able to reuse implementation and verification across chip designs, process node changes, frequency changes. Uh, changes in requirements, um, faster development cycles so that we can learn faster and scale to do more chips via leaner crews in this end of Moore's law era. Uh, things are more inherently parameterized when you have this more flexible generative substrate, right? Everything is capable of flexing more easily than it was before. And then uh, SWEs and HUIs have to increasingly work on these shared artifacts. SWE is software engineer, HUI is hardware engineer. So uh, the software engineers increasingly are gonna have to learn hardware cost models. Uh, because of this end of Moore's law world, all of the prior things will matter. Um, you know, it just takes time to realize that they do matter. And so, you know, there's this iron triangle or whatever they call it of like time scoping resources. And if you keep all of those relatively fixed and quality relatively fixed, you get efficiency from underlying tooling uh, improving and processes getting better. And so since that first checkpoint, we've developed uh, quite a lot of things. So we open sourced, um, we got approval for that in like February 2020, and uh, it came online, I, I forget exactly when we put, flipped the public bit on the repo. Uh, but we hosted five open source interns, so we had people ramp up on the code base, which was super encouraging. Um, we're able to JIT things to native code. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but uh, we have the ability to convert things into formal engine. We made a fuzzer for quality assurance across the whole stack. Some Boolean optimization capabilities came in. We did BDDs. We did some min cut algorithms and things I'll talk about more. We also did things down, uh, you know, down closer to uh, the technology node where uh, things like logical equivalence checking. So I'll talk about some of that later as well. So to give you a brief tour of this stack, so there's input languages like uh, DSL that we've developed and uh, C++ for teams that have existing code bases that do HLS via C++. And there's ways to run those natively, right? There's a way to run the DSL code directly and C++ can be compiled to native. But also these can be converted into XLS IR. And just uh, maybe not an important clarification point for this particular audience, but 
you know, sometimes people will think, oh, I could take arbitrary C++ off the shelf with like syscalls and malloc and stuff in it and compile it down uh, as HLS. But uh, obviously it's more like a DSL inside of C++ that is accepted by this uh, C++ front end called XLSCC, which I'll talk about later. Um, so it's not arbitrary C++. Okay, and so this uh, IR that we've created can be serialized and deserialized from text, uh, like in pretty much all compilers. Uh, we're able to interpret and JIT compile that IR for fast native simulation. So even though the DSL doesn't have a direct way to compile it into uh, native code, by going through the IR, we have a path to generate x86-64 code that runs at native speed, equivalent to C++, basically. Uh, we have a fuzzer, which is able to fuzz at this level and actually at the DSL language level as well. We're able to enqueue the IR into the logical equivalence checker for formal, uh, for formal uh, like the LEC process that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and we have a way to visualize this IR. And of course, once we optimize this IR, uh, we can do all the same things on it because it's the same data structure. And so once you have the optimized IR, then you schedule it for uh, either time multiplexed or pipelined code generation. Uh, you could generate it through your Verilog AST formatter. And then the system Verilog or Verilog that results, we support Verilog for backwards compatibility with tools like Icarus Verilog, which don't have very strong system Verilog support. Um, or that can be sent into the, say, ASIC synthesis flow to produce a net, net list, which then we can do logical equivalence checking against the higher level IR. Uh, so it's important also to point out some of the benefits we've already observed from this up leveling and kind of controlling our own tooling destiny. Uh, so we created this critical path visualization tool, which was very important for performance optimization. So it runs uh, on the command line. Oh, excuse me, I have to up, up level the um, resolution. The default is not high. Up quality 1080p. Okay, so it runs uh, as a command line tool. Uh, it brings up the standard set of benchmarks that we keep for QOR metrics. Uh, so we select one of those benchmarks I had to redact the number of picoseconds uh, on the top, but here we're displaying the critical path of this graph, uh, the whole program pipeline that we've created. You can zoom in on nodes. You can observe properties that the compiler knows about those nodes, including the delay. The things that have the most delay in the critical path show up big in red. You can click on the nodes to observe the corresponding source location they come from. You can do the backwards mapping where you click on the source and it shows you what the node is that corresponds to it. And so this is all actually open source, this IR visualizer. Uh, the type and uh, get Verilog out tool still hasn't been liberated yet, but that's been on my to-do list to liberate that tool uh, from inside the, the walls of Google 3. Uh, so just another view of what we just saw. Uh, this is the IR visualizer with the data flow representation, the zoomable pinnable graph, which scales to like tens of thousands of nodes, um, and then uh, the metadata about the node. And so then, like we said, the heat is relative to the critical path. So this was super key for iterating on the optimizations that we needed to be competitive with other tools that we were evaluating against. Uh, so one of the things that was uh, very important for getting competitive QOR results was this register minimizing scheduler. So this is just a contrived example to say, if I add something and I sign extend it, ideally, if that sign extension had slack, I would push it into cycle C2 so that it didn't create a bunch of flops across the C1, C2 boundary, right? But you need some tool that will reason about that instead of just packing it greedy as early as possible. And so you basically enumerate the nodes across the boundaries that have slack, and you do a min cut algorithm. So that's all open sourced as well. So there's some interesting algorithmic work that we got to do to try to generate nice pipelines through the pipeline generator. And so for designs that we're taping out, uh, we have some FP floating point blocks. Um, there's this one that's replicated many times throughout uh, TPU chips. Uh, and we were able to push button repipeline it for multiple different clock domains uh, and add features to it very easily through this flow. Um, so it was like 750 lines in a couple of different modules. Um, and this is all runs license free and has simple rules where you just do like Basil build and then you save the Verilog file and that pops out. And so what's cool is also with specialization in the HLS compiler, this was a unit that implements several different opcodes. If you just make a wrapper that specializes to say, run this with this given opcode, it actually can specialize the whole circuit for that given opcode. Uh, and we're still working on some range analysis that would specialize it even better than it's currently specialized today, but there's some optimizations that result from that specialization already. And so one very enabling thing 
is that with this JIT compiler that we built where we can compile the IR to native code, we're able to exhaustively test a 32-bit space. So if you had like a unary floating point uh, operator, you could exhaustively test it on your workstation in three minutes, which is about amortizes out to 150 nanoseconds to run that, that graph that we were looking at with the previous critical path. Uh, so that's super enabling. If you can change something and then exhaustively test the whole thing, or even just running uh, 4 billion randoms in the space of three minutes is uh, pretty enabling. So one nice property that comes from having a single source is that you don't have to duplicate effort uh, between writing the hardware definition and writing the golden reference model, we usually call it, uh, and then debugging the discrepancies between the two. So because it's generating and it's, and it's promising you the equivalence between the two, um, you actually avoid this whole step that teams uh, often say causes them serious effort of having to debug the differences between two different sides. And so we actually generate via this build rule definition, a uh, nice uh, C++ um, entry point API, just like you would define on your own if you had written it. Uh, so this is wrapped in like a, a status or like an error, potentially erroring value. That's why it does like dot value. But otherwise it's just passing a UN32 to a function and getting a value back. Okay, so for the logical equivalence checking flow, uh, we take our scheduled IR after the pipeline, we convert it into behavioral Verilog that synthesizes into a gate level netlist file. We have a netlist parser in our tree that creates a netlist data structure. Uh, we parse Liberty files that describe technology nodes and that provides an in-memory representation of the Boolean operations for any given cell. When you corre correlate the cells against the Boolean formulas that they implement, uh, you're able to enqueue that into a theorem prover, which talks SMT libs such as Z3. That's the one that we're currently using. Uh, and then we're also able to convert our IR into Z3. Uh, and then we're able to ask it, is stage zero equivalent? Is, is stage one equivalent? And we're able to do equivalence proofs through this process. Um, so we did that because teams were actually keenly interested in, can I trust uh, you know, this new tooling and am I comfortable taping it out? And you know, this kind of serves as an example of, I guess sometimes people throw tools over the wall and they're like, you should use this thing. And then teams have to like wrestle over whether they really want to or have to use this thing. Uh, so that's not the way that this whole uh, process is going. We're trying to make like a great Google hardware development flow and solve for all the problems that stand in the way together kind of as a uh, tooling plus uh, usage uh, at the same time. And so now it's open sourced, as I mentioned. Uh, and we take contributors. We've had a bunch of contributors since we opened the repo, which is great. Um, some other comparison uh, that we did in collaboration with a sister team, uh, we made this token encoder. Uh, we ported it so that it could run through our tool. Uh, initially, the latency was higher, but the gate count was the same. Uh, so that we identified what optimizations we were missing, and then we got the latency to be the same. And then in the end, the tool still compiled, I think it was like 500 times faster uh, for that result. So that was very enabling because it was actually a block that was like in their critical path of their design. Um, so being able to iterate on it, you know, many times faster was a very important capability for them. And of course, when you do this automation tooling, uh, what falls out is this automatic sweeping and plotting capability where you can even change the number of cycles as well as the target frequency and things like this. Uh, so the new frontier for us is these uh, communicating sequential processes, uh, which are iterating sequential entities um, that have recurrent state and then talk to each other over these channels, which is also similar to like uh, Go routines or actor model, this sort of thing. Um, and so we implemented a four by four MatMol uh, systolic array in this, in this new capability. And we're building out the code generation and deadlock detection and things like this for this uh, new paradigm of getting things that have recurrent state. Uh, so like I said, in the near future, that communicating sequential processes, um, system Verilog interoperations, so teams can more easily use us or export their existing type definitions for use in XLS code. Um, concolic testing, so if you've ever heard of American Fuzzy Lop or these other uh, software packages that automatically try to find cover points for you, because we can back solve for, you know, what, what will flip this MUX selector in the IR, we can actually potentially automatically do something like automatic cover point generation, so we're investigating some of that. Um, with the same thing we do for delay estimation, we can do area and power estimates. Uh, and also because we want to connect all these together in a more general way that might share resources, we're also looking at uh, NOC component generation this coming quarter. Uh, 
So I think that's about all I have uh, for my part. Uh, Sean uh, on a sister team is working on the C++ front end, uh, and there's some examples of just you can just check it out and uh, try compiling a CC file. Originally, the prototype was written in PyC parser, but it's uh, the Clang-based implementation that's going to be landing soon. So you can take references; they get optimized the way that you would expect. Uh, you can do variable length integers according to like the AC int headers, which seem to be industry standard. Um, and it optimizes to what you would expect. And then there's some cool FPGA demos just that we did as uh, little hobby side things uh, using all open source tools, actually, Yosis and NextPNR. Uh, so thanks. And that these are the links for uh, how to find out more or get in touch. And we'd love to collaborate with more people. So I think that's all I've got. So thank you for the talk. Very impressive. Uh, one thing I was noticing is a Rust-like syntax. Is it mm -hmm. uh, strictly a subset? So in the sense, like it's a, I'm assuming it's a subset of Rust. But it's, yeah, a strict, it's, it's not a strict it, so. It, so I cannot run it on Rust compiler? Oh, yeah. So it is not a strict subset. And the reason is that uh, parametrics to do with inter integral values are uh, not well supported in Rust today. Um, and okay. so, yeah, uh, there is some world in which potentially you could take the thing and compile it as Rust code. But as we add more features that are more hardware specific, like uh, communicating sequential processes and things like this, having the ability to make first class syntax for those might actually be quite convenient versus trying to be backwards compilable with, uh, compatible with something you could compile for native. Um, but that also could be, you know, that could be kind of the outside that you lift uh, functions that could compile us both into. Uh, it's just that there's benefits to specializing your syntax for the particular domain. It's kind of the, one of the premises of this domain specific language uh, advantage. Yeah, so we're also, with Pyro, we are doing specific syntax. Now, yes, curious, you were saying that you have like an actor model that you are trying to go is for having like a um, communication with latency sen sensitive designs. You are going to do that, or what yeah. So if if you make the actor, so we call it communicating sequential processes, right? So if you make the process async and you constrain it at the compiler to be uh, clocks equals one, right? Effectively, now you've made RTL if you say the channels between these things are flop layers, right? At that point, it's basically RTL because you're describing this is a flop layer in, flop layer out. Here's the combo logic that lives in between, and my recurrent state only comes, you know, via that that piece, right? It also looks potentially similar to a, atomic guarded actions uh, if you put the constraints on it, right? Um, and so, yeah, but for fully latency and sensitive designs, you want to do something that's more like con process networks, right? Uh, where once you verify it, um, you know, the firing rules happen however they happen, but you verified it for all possible internal timings, right? And so uh, often people will, we've, we've seen from talking to people who are using HLS techniques, people will try to create con process network oriented designs so that their verification will port. And then at places like arbiters where you can't use a con process network style design, then you do async, and those are where you know your verification and cycle timing becomes important. Your tech node uh, specific verification becomes important. Okay, thank you. There is any question from someone else? So All right, one well, thing. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. One, one quick thing. I noticed that you were. Play, uh, changing and the process of changing the parser from a Python to a C++. Do you know what's the status there? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I had to prepare this presentation. So I'm behind uh, you know, a little bit from where I thought I would be. Uh, but I've ported over the, the parser, the, um, let's see, what did I port over? The scanner, the parser, um, the type information that's carried from deductive type inference. Uh, I think I have to port over the interpreter right now because the deductive type inference itself, like the deduction rules uh, for parametric things, it also calls the interpreter. So once I port over the interpreter, then I can port over the type checker, and then I think I have the transitive closure of all the front end stuff in C++. Uh, okay. So it should be like another week or two, I think. Uh, okay, that's fast. I'm yeah. just curious. No, for benchmarking, because we usually benchmark to see how are we doing with other tools and try to get better. But with the Python, it was not really fair. So we're waiting for the C++. 
Yeah, sounds good. So in a couple of weeks, I should have that to you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, any other question? We're running a little bit over the time, but I think it's okay. We are the last one on the session. So, so Stephen, uh, it's going to be the next speaker. Um, it's going to be talking about a new flow uh, that is a, a circuit. And thank you very much for volunteering to give the talk. Can you guys see this? Yes, I can see the slides and I can hear you well. Thank you. Oh, great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Circuit. I'm from Xilinx. I work in the, the research labs, but uh, Circuit is a, uh, a collaborative project that we've been doing in open source with uh, quite a few other people. Uh, so the, the vision here, I think uh, I won't spend too much time on. I think a lot of you really share this uh, vision that uh, for hardware design, we need to have open source tools that are equivalent to the, the open source tools that have taken over the software world. Right? So basically, nobody builds their own closed source compilers anymore. Everybody uh, either builds in open source in Clang or GCC and, uh, and or builds uh, closed source tools that, that build off of those frameworks, right? So uh, I, I think the question is, how, how do we get to the point where we have the same uh, capabilities in hardware where there's good open source infrastructure that has effective end-to-end -end flows and that people can build off of and perhaps build their own uh, special uh, sauce for their, for their proprietary tools. And I think uh, one of the key things here is that we really want to be able to embrace uh, having multiple levels of abstraction in our designs. I think this is uh, one of the key things that uh, all of the, the new hardware design is really moving towards is, is uh, the, the fact that if you get locked into just doing RTL design, then uh, you, there's only so much of the design space that you can get to through logic synthesis, basically. And, and people have scraped for how do I get a few extra percent in, in, my, uh, in my logic synthesis for a very long time. Whereas there's a huge design space if you can explore higher levels of abstraction and explore uh, larger trade-offs. And to me, this is kind of the core of what, what I think high-level synthesis uh, is. So we would like to have uh, design tools that handle multiple levels of abstraction. And, and this is where MLIR comes in. So uh, MLIR is a new LLVM project that is focused on building open source compiler infrastructure and embracing this, this idea that you want to have uh, many levels of abstractions and that these abstractions, because you have good infrastructure, these abstractions are very cheap to build. And so you can, you're never stuck with uh, whether or not I, I can, I've picked the right one, right? You can always uh, build a new one and, and express its behavior in terms of uh, the connections to the other abstractions that you already have. So my, my view is that this is going to become the, the core tooling for uh, all of our next generation domain specific adaptive computing platforms, whether it's CPUs or GPUs or building accelerators or, or building hardware, whether that's in programmable logic or, or in ASIC technology, I, I think uh, we need to have some some end-to-end -end infrastructure like this. Um, and MLIR today is has traditionally been focused on on most of mostly software models. So, for machine learning and targeting uh, processors through through LLVM, but uh, the, the, what we're working on is how do we add uh, HDLs to this? Uh, how do we add, add uh, FPGA and basic backends with the goal of sharing as much of the the target independent code as you possibly can. Uh, so this is where Circuit comes in. Circuit is, is basically applying MLIR to the, the, the field of hardware design. Uh, so this is an LLVM incubator project. We have a number of collaborators uh, from Xilinx and, and also elsewhere across industry and academia. And, and the focus here is really on, I would say, the RTL level and above. So uh, how do we interface with a lot of the existing languages that people use, uh, nominally things like System Verilog and I would say better HDLs like, like Chisel or BlueSpec, um, but also high-level synthesis where you are generating uh, designs from, from sequential algorithms. That makes it very easy for people to, to get into these design tools. 
And obviously we want to support both FPGA targets, that's uh, where Xilinx is very interested, but also most of our, several of our collaborators are really focused on, on ASICs. Um, and I think that the particular value of Circuit compared to a lot of the other open source frameworks out there is that you have this very close coupling between the things that are the hardware concepts uh, that you know, Chris mentioned, a lot of them like communicating sequential processes and, and data flow and things like that. Um, and also the, the software concepts. How do I have, how, how do I model the behavior of my processors and the behavior of, of DMAs and, and, and things like that. Um, and ultimately, I think HLS is a, is a key part of that. And then also you get a lot of uh, nice integrated simulations. So uh, you can, this is something that, that we kind of get to leverage for free because MLIR has already well integrated with all of them. Uh, so why do we need MLIR for hardware? I kind of touched a little bit on this before. Uh, so in, in MLIR, it's really a, a framework for designing abstractions. And in MLIR, these are called dialects. And so the, the advantage is that we can build dialects that represent high level abstractions. So this is a process or uh, this is a, a, a queue and also very device specific concepts. So things at the RTL level or things that are concepts that represent uh, the, the pieces of, of my device. And we can also express things like explicit and concurrency and data movement that are key for getting efficient execution in uh, modern devices. Uh, and, and we don't have to pick one IR. We don't have to pick one abstraction. We can build new abstractions very easily and integrate them. And, and this makes it, uh, I think a very easy way to leverage a lot of uh, other people's work. So if you build an MLIR, then it's very easy to, to leverage the other work that other people are doing and for them to, uh, to leverage your work. So uh, an important thing is that uh, dialects aren't mutually exclusive. So dialects can compose in a single design. Uh, and what this means is I think two things. One is uh, if you have uh, a heterogeneous device, it makes sense to represent different parts of the device in different ways. Uh, and, and so I think this is a, a, a kind of a, a key part as we build more and more complex devices, we, we need to represent uh, different parts of the design in different ways. Uh, the second piece is really as you're, as you're moving through the design process, uh, either uh, from, from the front end to the back end or, or even uh, across different levels of hierarchy, uh, you can you can use the right model at the right place. Right? So for instance, you might not only want to have uh, a data flow model at, at the high level, but then you want to encapsulate and still build your uh, maybe very low level designed uh, RTL style uh, IP. Uh, and in MLIR, these kind of uh, the properties of these dialects are, are defined in a dialect independent way. So there's a, a interface there's our, there are interfaces and traits in the framework that allow you to describe the kind of ab abstract semantics of operations. So for instance, if you have add a new dialect that has an operation and this operation you declare to be side effect free using uh, the appropriate trait, then uh, the framework can op automatically optimize that. So for instance, this would enable dead code elimination. So in, in the same way that uh, the, the first speaker was talking about separating the, the data structures from the algorithms. This gives a way of, of doing that for a very wide range of uh, design characteristics. Um, and lastly, you know, we, uh, MLIR is also capable of representing both uh, software and hardware concepts. So uh, there's a kind of built-in notion of SSA CFG regions that, that are very familiar if you're coming from a, a compiler background. You have basic blocks and sequential control flow. There's also a, a graph region kind of concept where that's good for representing designs with feedback um, and concurrent models, whether they're RTL oriented or whether they're data flow oriented or, or other kinds of concurrent models like actors. So the, the current status, this is a relatively young project. It's you know, basically born in COVID. Uh, we're still working towards having an end-to-end -end flow, but uh, we kind of envision uh, being able to go all the way from high level designs like uh, expressing uh, tensor computations or affine loops and go all the way down to generating RTL. Uh, so we currently have in flight a few different uh, dialects that I've shown here, um, but we get to also leverage a lot of the existing infrastructure that, that MLIR has built to, to uh, target processors. 
So I'm going to go through and, and kind of give you a, a brief introduction to MLIR. Uh, so in MLIR, there's, you can define your own operations and operations can have an arbitrary number of inputs and outputs. Uh, the operations are organized into dialects that are kind of a, a namespacing uh, concept. So this makes it easy to, uh, to sort of tell where an operation comes from and to distinguish them kind of mentally. Uh, but these dialects are also not mutually exclusive. So here, the, you know, I have a custom dialect that also uh, contains operations from the, from the standard dialect. Uh, operations themselves have regions. So this is something that's a little bit unusual. A lot of frameworks, uh, you can, you're defining operations, but in, in uh, MLIR, operations can actually contain code. And, uh, the, so you can have an arbitrary number of operations that have uh, arbitrary other kinds of code. Uh, regions can contain blocks. So in this case, uh, the, the basic block concept from SSA CFGs is, is basically a built-in concept and uh, blocks can contain other operations. So you basically have, uh, at the end of each block also uh, a terminator operation. So the terminator uh, defines where control flow goes at the end of the basic block. So uh, each basic block starts and executes sequentially to completion, uh, and then the control flow is represented with terminators. Uh, the other thing that you see here is also that uh, regions can either be SSA CFG regions. So this is kind of a, the, the familiar sequential model, but uh, as I mentioned before, you can also have uh, graph regions. So the key difference is that uh, in, in this uh, region, there's two operations, and the output of one operation is the input of the other. And so there's a, there's a feedback loop here. And normally in uh, most compiler IRs, this is something that would be disallowed because you can't execute these in, in any particular order. Um, in MLIR, this is something that's allowed uh, based on the semantics of the, of the containing operation. Uh, and so this is how we represent uh, concurrency. So I want to talk about one dialect that I mentioned earlier that, that we have a, there's a handshake dialect that is sort of a, a little bit of a superset both of a com process network kind of model and a communicating sequential process. So the idea here is that processes uh, interact uh, through streams and the interaction between a process and other process is handshaked. Uh, so there is there's back pressure when a, when a process tries to push to a, a, a FIFO, there might not be space for it. And this gives you a way of, uh, uh, of representing decoupled processes in hardware. And uh, there's also uh, feedback loops from one process to another. So in this case, uh, process two is writing into, a, into a, a FIFO that connects back to process one. This has a lot of advantages if you're building large hardware designs uh, where the, you want to separate the behavior of one part of a de design from another part of a design so that you can get uh, timing closure in the, within a process and then rely on the uh, elastic uh, behavior between different processes to synchronize uh, at larger distances within a ship. So this breaks up uh, long paths and, and makes time enclosure easier. And in MLIR, we can model this with a, with a graph. There's a number of uh, operations that we that are part of this dialect, uh, in addition to the, the container concept that has a, has a region which is handshaked. And the, these uh, components are, are sufficient for us to take uh, sequential C code and turn it into the, the handshaked uh, dialect at, uh, at a fine level. So we can take you know, basically each operator and turn it into a, a separate executing process. And then when we implement this in hardware, uh, there's kind of a natural implementation where each FIFO becomes a memory and each uh, connection between a process and a FIFO becomes a set of wires, right? So there's this natural separation between a higher level abstraction where I'm going to manipulate the, the, the data flow model in a, with, with one uh, mindset, uh, uh, but then you can lower into the uh, uh, kind of a traditional RTL uh, representation with, with memory and finite state machines and, and wires. 
Uh, we also have uh, a, in, in addition to the uh, handshake circuits, which represent dynamic control flow, we also have a, a dialect that represents uh, static pipelines. Uh, so this is uh, the, the way that we've chosen to start doing that, where there is an operation that takes a number of inputs, and then each uh, basic block is used to represent the a pipeline stage. So it's very easy to move operations between pipeline stages and and change the effective scheduling of, of this design. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, an interesting way to, to leverage some, some of the core concepts in MLIR uh, to, to design things in a, in a very different way than, than you might otherwise. Uh, so one of the things we've been working towards is an end-to-end -end flow that starts from uh, a standard dialect. Uh, you can imagine uh, extracting the parts of a basic block in the standard dialect into a pipeline region. Uh, this is basically kind of identifying the large components which are going to be statically scheduled regions. Then we can convert the rest of the control logic into uh, the handshake dialect and build a model which is uh, completely handshaked. Eventually we will lower that into fertile, uh, from fertile to a graph, another, a different kind of graph model, which is uh, representing RTL. That's something that you can also run a lot of the RTL kinds of optimizations that uh, the other speakers have been talking about. Uh, do bit, maybe bit level optimization uh, on the RTL and eventually lower into Verilog. Uh, and, and even Verilog here is something we envision being represented in MLIR as another dialect. And the reason is that you can do a lot of readability transformations at the syntactic level uh, that are very similar to the, to the functional uh, transformations that you might do otherwise. And, and these are very important for getting a good readable Verilog out of the output. So if you, if you generate RTL, but nobody can understand what's coming out, then that's often very disconcerting for people. So that's a, I think there's a, a significant usability benefit. So, uh, what you see here is we're using MLIR in kind of an end-to-end -end way and a very composable way with uh, different parts of uh, the framework. Uh, so this is an example of that lowering. So here, you, this is a, a simple uh, handshake circuit that takes uh, two inputs and a, uh, a start signal. So uh, this, in this case, the, the first two arguments are uh, handshaked data, and the third argument is a is a start signal to to start this uh, this function. Uh, and the way it's implemented is that there's a uh, the uh, add operation takes uh, two inputs and re returns the output, and then the return takes the uh, the control input separately. So as part of lowering this into fertile, the this add operation is going to get turned into uh, a library function, which is automatically generated. And this library function has uh, fertile types represented in MLIR and various fertile operations to, to access those types and uh, connect signals. So uh, whereas the, this is a case where the handshake design is actually a graph region and the fertile module is actually an SSA CFG region because uh, the way fertile represents uh, signals, you need to connect to them. So this is very kind of one-to-one -one isomorphic with uh, at Xilinx, we're also very interested in devices that are more than just programmable logic. So we don't see that uh, hardware design is done in isolation. Uh, you want to design what goes into programmable logic and separately have uh, parts of your design running on processors and parts of your design running on uh, the vector VLIW processors that are coming in on new devices. So in that those vector VLAW processors are organized in an array of, of cores with interconnect between them. And these processors can both connect to the interconnect uh, for longer communication. Uh, basically, each one of these is a, is a switch box in, the, in a network on chip. Uh, the processors can also communicate directly to one another. So in this case, I have a processor that's look, uh, connected to four different memories. It's connected to a memory on the left and it's connected to its own memory on the right. Uh, and it's also connected to memories uh, north and, and south. So here there's a number of concepts in the architecture that are reflected in uh, a dialect that we've been building in MLIR. Uh, so the, the dialect represents a tile, which exists as this gray box in the architecture. 
uh, there's a concept of a core, which can contain sequential code that's going to execute on the core. There's a concept of memory, which contains uh, memory blocks and, and DMA instructions for copying data from one memory to another. There's a dialect that represents uh, switch boxes, and there's a dialect that represents locks, which are uh, part of this tile and are used to synchronize communication from one core to the next. Uh, so this, is, this physical dialect is something that we can uh, lower from a higher level logical dialect through the, a kind of standard place and route style process. Um, and then represents a, a lowering where we can uh, generate the binary code uh, from this. Right? So that, there's nothing I would say particularly magical about this, um, but it's maybe a non-obvious use of how you can represent uh, of, of the value of representing uh, heterogeneous uh, concepts in a framework like MLIR because we want these uh, processor designs to also interoperate with the part that's uh, being implemented in programmable logic. So if you'd like to get involved or talk further, uh, we also have uh, all the code is on GitHub and uh, there's also a lot of activity both on Discord and uh, Discourse and we have uh, weekly design meetings. So I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, also a lot of work very related to many things. Uh, one question that I have on the handshake mm -hmm. uh, you were talking. If you are reading some language like Ver Verilog, how do you specify the handshake? How do you build that? Or is it like a library kind of thing? Or how do you do well, that? Well, think about it as a, as a, as a it, it's both a language. So MLIR as a, as a, has a textual syntax. And that textual syntax is, is like a language for just describing data flow directly. Um, the, the way I see it is that if you want to have a uh, maybe a special language for describing data flow, uh, that's something that you would want to have a dialect that is in MLIR, which is very close to the input language, and then do the lowering from the input language into the, the, the handshaked uh, dialect. Uh, alternatively, you could have a domain-specific language that was embedded in C++ or a domain-specific language that's embedded in Verilog and uh, do something similar, right? So here the, the, the key thing is, is that the, the abstractions kind of exist independently from the transformations between them. So you get to define kind of whatever transformations you want. Um, so for instance, like the, the, the handshake uh, data flow dialect is something that you can use at a very fine grain level to represent uh, the communication between uh, an adder and a multiplier in a hardware design that's handshaked. Uh, you can also represent it, use it to represent uh, the communication from one task on one processor to another task on another processor, which is something that we do in the, the vector VLIW processor array I was showing. Okay, so it's mostly that you have to have multiple language unless currently to specify one thing is the handshake and then you can have the inputs in some other language and it's a way to glue it together. Well, essentially these dialects are little languages, right? Okay. And, and uh, but they're little languages that come with a lot of built-in infrastructure for transforming one language into another, which is what we're all doing all the time, basically. So it, my belief is that instead of uh, building up that, the, that infrastructure over and over and over again for lots of different, uh, for, for new languages, once you start saying, well, I want to build lots of languages and they all interoperate with each other, because of course we want everything to interoperate, um, then MLIR is a nice framework for doing that. Okay. Now, one thing that it, uh, that there is another question from anyone else? So I'm curious about one thing. I know that the industry, they say quite a bit that they want to have the Verilog generated more readable. And that's one common complaint for Fertile at uh, Chisel uh, that I heard many times. But in our group, we are trying to do a little bit different. And let me explain and to see what do you think or what the other mm -hmm. people think, because we can have a little more open discussion uh, what we think. Uh, is that in our cases like XLS and those things, we have several input languages and we, most of the time we generate very log because that's what the commercial synthesis tools are going to run. But uh, in the way I see this 
very lucky is if we were doing C and we were generating some program, we will not be debugging the assembly. So what we are able to do is bring that information back to the original program. Uh, but what we are saying here is that we want to debug the assembly, which is a very lock. So I, instead I, of bringing the information back. I, I think there's, there's a few things going on. Uh, so, so one is that, yes, it, you, obviously you want to debug in your source language whenever you possibly can. Um, and, and so having the framework be able to carry debug info essentially from, from the source language through all of the transformation steps to the output is, is important. Um, I think at the same time, there are places where, especially in hardware design flows, where you start wanting to do things a little bit more carefully, right? So in hardware design, people care a lot about risk, right? So they're not gonna accept new flows without being able to maybe validate the output. Right. And today, for what that means is that people are writing Verilog by hand, and so they want to be able to look at the Verilog. Um, in, in hardware design, another thing that happens is you have late design changes. Right. So either you need to have a framework like uh, what Chen Hong was talking about, where you have uh, the ability to do very fast uh, resynthesis and make minor modifications or, or ECO changes to your hardware, or you need to be able to make those changes explicitly late in a design, right? And so mm -hmm. maybe what you want to do is to be able to take the Verilog and, and modify it. Um, but, but certainly being able to read it and, and debug it as a, even as a tool developer is important. If what you get out is, is just uh, uh, a big garbage blob, <laughs> then, then that's very difficult. Yeah, and I'm curious about Chris' take on this because in their case it's more like a little bit more HLS like a more high level synthesis, so the very log generated by definition will be much harder to read. Uh, yes. so what, do you allow, do the people read it, do they patch it, or do you try to hide it to bring in information back? How do you handle that? Yeah, yeah so it's a, it's a good, it's like an interesting frontier is actually in my next steps uh, slide. So ideally, well, so there's a bunch of things we're gonna do to try to hit it with like kind of all the hammers that we can. So one is our DSL is already a data flow DSL. So there's not like, uh, you know, CFG conversion to DSL, uh, a conversion to uh, DF CDFG or DFG mismatches there already. So there's already kind of more of a correspondence between the syntax and the data flow that ends up happening. Uh, and that's also carried through those communicating sequential processes. Those are all data flow elements in a data flow design, right? Uh, but then there's also, you know, people are going to want a waveform debug. We've talked about potentially doing a custom waveform viewer that is VCD and metadata that's exported from system Verilog designs and doing an overlay. That's a possibility. Another thing is recording, you know, either through VPI or through dumping things into the logs and replaying them against the original elements, uh, basically taking things that come from the late stage and replaying them against the uh, simulation infrastructure for the HLS tooling. Uh, but also we're trying to retain as much stuff as we can from the original source language. So there's actually, I think Mark landed some CLs this week even. Uh, just like because we're data flow, the compiler is a mixer, but you know it's not like an inscrutable mixer. A lot of the things it mixes together and changes and optimizes are pretty possible to understand. So you could always keep like an optimization transaction log that you could also look at like, how did this node get to be this way here? And you could also try to deduce, like, what's the best name to use given the optimization I'm doing is, you know, replacing this thing with that thing. Uh, so you'll probably see the guts of the compiler have more contextual, like, what should I do with respect to debug information inside? But it's, it's, it's a difficult problem. Debugging optimized assembly from GCC03 is a problem that goes back forever, right? Um, and I think people want to still be able to do things on the Verilog level. So I think you can't ignore uh, the fact that people want to do that. I think you have to do, see what you can reasonably do to accommodate that, that desire still to be used in more designs and to get more attraction and adoption. We're already working with kind of our internal partners on you know, giving them what they want there. Actually, I, I think Chris brings up a good point about kind of narrowing the problem domain. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with data flow, that's actually kind of an easy part. Uh, I think it becomes a lot harder when you start wanting to deal with memory and state. And this is where a lot of the interesting verification problems come in. 
uh, so I, I'm maybe I'm uh, kind of an open question to, to everybody. Uh, how do you how do you see this? Uh, how, how do we get to uh, you know kind of more complex designs that have lots of uh, state and complexity? Right? People always want to build processors, but all the all the complexity in a processor is in how do you deal with the the instruction control and the forwarding paths? Uh, is that something that we can imagine uh, designing or or having the tool help us design? and having support for that? Or is it something that people are always just gonna be stuck designing? Maybe, maybe. What do you, I'm curious what Chris thinks. Yeah. Maybe it depends a lot on what kinds of circuits you're, you're trying to build. Yeah, definitely. And I think in the era of specialized circuitry, sometimes maybe, um, sometimes maybe we'll get easy wins from the specialization aspect, uh, which is great when we can get it. But then, like you say, there's probably like some essential complexity that's difficult to distill about some of these problems, right? And it, you can use higher level abstractions to try to help you manage the complexity, but then verifying the complexity in its final context, you know, maybe that's like a fixed quantity thing. So if you look at how have people done formal uh, for CPU designs, uh, we probably have to build a lot of those elements into our flow as well of like, how do we get people to do good formal? How do we add this kind of, uh, you know, automatic cover point testing, like uh, back solving for the logic of their of their composed program. Uh, so I think part of our job is like figuring out what tools we can bring to bear from all of this cool stuff that we have going on in the ecosystem, like concolic testing or you know SAT solvers and uh, composition based programming, which works well even for like you know a Google service that runs at scale is a giant stateful thing but it's built out of verified, composed, uh, thoroughly tested elements, right? So what, yeah. what can we bring to bear from what we know about doing this well to a uh, hardware domain? Is there anything that's been left on the table, right? One question I'd like to open to, to other people, and I'm not so sure there is a solution, but, or if it's bad, but there is starting to be several flows like there is the XLS, there is the circuit, like let's see, that's just here. But then outside there is the JOSIS, there is the LLHD. There are many flows, each one of them tend to have their own in IR internal and they, they live by themselves. If we look in the compiler community, there are not so many compiler flows like what we are having on hardware, it's a little the wild west now, <laughs> in the sense like we are trying to do our own thing. Uh, in a way it will be good if they converge, but in a way I think it's too early. Uh, because we are still on the Wild West, which is a bit strange because industry has been on this domain for a long time. But if you look at the internals and what each flow is doing, it's very different uh, solution. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's interesting that you bring up LLHD because uh, the, the folks who were behind LLHD have started uh, rebuilding it in MLIR uh, because they, they see this problem, right? They, they, they like to get as much leverage from other parts of the framework and, and not go uh, build everything themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think so it's I a, a real problem, right? There, you know, we have to get uh, critical mass around, around something yeah. uh, in order to get things to reach the scope of, of doing interesting problems. So I have probably a story to tell here, which is my whole career I've worked on different custom compilers that were important in various aspects. Um, so in some ways, so I also worked on a JavaScript compiler, uh, which was called SpiderMonkey, and Google had Google's V8 engine, right? And there was like a fundamental design decision inside of the compiler, which was like, how do you represent a value in JavaScript, right? And so you can either shove a 47-bit virtual pointer inside of a double precision value in the 57-bit mantissa, uh, and that's one way to represent values, right? Or you can put doubles on the heap and like keep your uh, value representing, uh, you know, something as an integer. And this fundamental design decision created tons of different trade-offs and explorations and really interesting opportunities to go innovate on various aspects. They needed a fast generational GC. You know, we had different trade-offs in what our optimizer needed to reason about for these values on trace. And so I think, you know, 
you, you can kind of draw these lines of like, hey, what seems valuable to uh, Versa FPGA? What seems valuable to, you know, this kind of flow, ASIC flow over here or something? Iterate those points to infinity, and they'll both discover like super useful things and cross-pollinate in important and interesting ways. So I think, I think I'd take the opposite stance and say there's lots of room for different approaches, and especially when you don't really know what's going to work out for what particular context, like when you're starting to adopt new ideas in this end of Moore's Law specialization era, diversity of exploration and uh, attempt is a very important property to have. Yep. Is there anything else someone wants to say in another question? No, with that diversity point, let's let me thank everybody who has participated on the on the talk, uh, and thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll interact with each other again because it's a community, but it's not so big community, uh, and we'll find each other for getting feedback. So thank you very much, everybody, and see you around.